Fantastic. Well, I am excited to be here. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Ippolite. I'm going to be talking today about um, the concept of um, uh, um, uh, leaning on embeddings and the, and the concept of vectors behind them for something beyond semantic search. There's a lot of discussion, and there should be, about semantic search, and I want to explore some of the other things you can do uh, with embeddings and how we can do some interesting matching techniques and some fun stuff that I hope uh, makes you think about what else you can do since you've already got these uh, environments set up for semantic search. And before I dive into that, I wanted to just, I, you know, I, I, I take a little minute to, um, I take a little minute to talk about my AI journey when I do these presentations, only because I'm hoping that that people that are watching uh, recognize this as well too. So I'm I'm really just doing this for the sake of uh, if you're on this same journey, knowing that you're on the right path, right? So um, so actually, I got my my sort of AI start um, with um, machine learning. Actually, I, and as a hobby, I'm a I'm a sports guy. We were just talking about a bunch of sports stuff here, but um, I actually ended up uh, creating. <laughs> I didn't know they were machine learning models at the time. We, they were like algorithms is what they call them. And I created some uh, machine learning models to help uh, beat my friends and family at fantasy football. And that ended up, those ended up becoming so popular and disruptive within fantasy sports that that led to a uh, serious uh, fantasy sports radio gig that I had for three years. I then went on to work, as you're seeing on screen here, under a different name, uh, working for the NFL. I was an NFL analytics expert, uh, leveraging machine learning and data that I stored inside FileMaker. And so this whole time, I was just like, oh, this is this fun thing that I do on the side because I love sports and I love uh, data. But then I realized, wait a minute, all my customers could benefit from this. And right around that same time, I wouldn't say around that same time, this is probably about 10 years later, but CoreML became part of the platform. We all know CoreML. Um, and I started going, oh, cool, I can actually build these uh, models that are relevant to my customers. This is great. Everybody wins. And then I started to realize that um, not all models needed to be custom. And Heidi, this one's for you. Um, uh, I realized actually through the help of Heidi that I don't have to create a machine learning model for everything. And that was actually kind of a good solution too, because as we know about CoreML models, they um, only run on Mac OS um, or on you know Mac operating systems. And so you know, you're kind of hamstrung if you're committing to, to building out a model in, uh, in, in, that can only run on uh, where most of your clients' applications uh, are or can't can't run, basically, uh, or the vice versa. You guys see what I'm saying there. So Heidi actually introduced me to Monkey Learn, and Monkey Learn is essentially well. There's two realizations. One, I need to be able to do something that all FileMaker desktops can uh, to, can use, not just the Mac ones. And um, and then I realized, oh, I need to actually. I realized also I don't need to create custom models for everything. Like uh, I was doing the same kind of thing all the time, summarization or sentiment analysis or classification or keyword extraction. And this, you know, there are systems out there in the cloud where you can just make API connections to, you can create your own custom models or just connect to the ones that are already out there, do a little bit of training and make API connections to them. And that's really when um, the the all the pieces fell into place for me. So that as I started to just really research a lot of cloud-based um, API models um, and a bit of my fandom for, um, uh, I was I'm, I was a big Elon Musk fan and I was following what he was doing just from an engineering standpoint and space and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> I'm not necessarily a fan of his tweets. I don't want to come off that way or anything, but he had started this, org it was one of the key members that started an organization called OpenAI and I was paying a ton of attention to it. And then finally, a couple of years later, um, they in 2020 they came out with the uh, API to they used to have a sandbox and they came out with an API that I got somehow I don't know how it happened but I got early access to it and I started playing around with it and this is actually the sandbox I created for myself back in uh, you know the summer of 2020 where I was just sort of figuring out how to how, what this meant and um, I did a little bit of a think week where. Um, that was the year I turned 50 and my wife was cool enough to let me go rent this house out in Big Sur and just like read stuff and, and you know, deep dive into technology. And I've been planning on it for months. And I got there on the first day I started playing with OpenAI because I had just had barely enough internet to be able to make API calls. And that's all I did for 10 days. And I came out of there and I literally was like, this changes everything. I didn't even know how to talk to my team about it. But ultimately, we said, okay, well, we're already doing custom machine learning model services for our clients. Let's, uh, you know, let's add this in there as well, too. So I'm proud to say that we've been making these applications since then. And I'm even prouder to say, friends, that just earlier today, one of the applications that we created, really proud that um, we've been working with 3M 
and deployed the, the very first generative AI application that ran in the entire global network of, of 3M. And it was on FileMaker, and it was in FileMaker, uh, integrated in with the AI additional systems that we created. And just today, um, a couple of years later, it won the uh, Global Marketing Excellence Award within 3M for the greatest application. So I'm proud to say that um, these applications are real. Value is real. We ended up actually, uh, the, the, the ROI was through the roof on this. It does multiple things. It actually creates, um, uh, <clears throat> I'll allude to these as we talk here today. But it creates product descriptions for like a million different SKUs and and um, and then it runs these product descriptions through various different guardrails and make sure that they're all appropriate. And then it does translations as well, too. And these were all cost centers when they were really going through some trouble um, where uh, they were, you know, they needed to figure out a way to be able to localize things uh, at, 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 at uh, reasonable cost. And and an application like this driven by uh, Gen AI was uh, was very uh, profoundly uh, impactful for them. So. Despite what you may hear, despite what people say about AI, it is real. It's driving ROI. It's saving people tons of money. It's not uh, taking away people's jobs or anything just yet, I guess. But um, it's doing really important things out there. So that's a little bit of how I got here. And the focus of the conversation today is about embeddings and vectors, and they're really kind of you know intertwined. And um, so, you know, I, I assume many of you are already familiar with the, these concepts, or maybe you've even played with them yourselves, but just on the off chance that somebody here uh, or somebody watching uh, is not quite familiar with what these are, I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept, because it's actually really quite fascinating. And it only has partially to do with generative AI. It's, these models certainly play a role, but but it's kind of a tertiary technology to it, and I think a really important one. So, um, so if we want to talk a little bit about... Um, this concept of embeddings. It's almost, I mean, you could arguably say embedding data is like a verb. This is something that you're doing to data. So um, understanding this concept of vectors really really starts with understanding the concept of embeddings or creating vectors in the first place. And embedding text is actually a process and it involves using specially trained models. These are language models like that are, that are specially tuned for these uh, tasks to turn to translate specifically words, which as humans understand, into numbers that machine learning models understand. And a good embedding model can capture a bunch of different features of a word, um, like color, size, or texture. That's the kind of feature that I'm talking about. So um, some of these may uh, become combinations of features. So actually, I guess really what I'm talking about when I say features is when, when it is taking text and turning it into numbers, every sequence of numbers that it's uh, turning it into represents a feature of that word. So, for example, um, we might look at the word soccer that you see on screen here. And you see I have two columns, so I have these two numbers. Uh, those each could represent, uh, is sort of a, you know, trying to wrap our heads around this. Let's say they represent a feature of soccer, like a ball or a sport, for example, right? And the features are meaningful because these are, are actually coordinates that get plotted on a graph. And I'm going to show you what, what uh, the graph looks like in a second. You guys all get you know, X, Y coordinates and how they get plotted into a, a quadrant. That's really the same concept that we're talking about here. But um, so what's what's actually happening when we're vectorizing uh, or when we're, um, you know, uh, using an embeddings model to actually turn text into numbers is we're actually identifying features and then we're uh, storing those features. And why would we do something like that? Well, here's the fascinating thing about this. Um, actually, uh, why would we use language models? This is kind of a thought experiment that I'll throw at you guys here. So I just mentioned soccer and I just said, um, you know, how, what are a couple of features of soccer? And I said ball and sport. Well, if I challenge you to think of 4,000 features of a soccer, of the word soccer, it would, I, I dare say, be humanly impossible, right? Maybe if I give you a ton of time, but it's probably impossible. So that is, that's an example of what one of these specially trained embeddings models can do is extract tons and tons of meaning from words or phrases or even entire documents. So in, in the process of turning words into numbers is also identifying features and then plotting those features to identify what this word, phrase, or document is into this multidimensional space. I'm going to show you what the multidimensional multi space looks like, and that's actually very meaningful, believe it or not. So for the mo for your moment, imagine not a XY, 2D XY coordinate, but like an entire you know uh, multidimensional uh, one, and I'll show you that in a second. So some of these models, and I'm, this is an important point I'm going to get to a little bit later in the presentation, can identify two different features of a word, 
Some of them can do 300. Those, by the way, are the most popular ones that we use. Some of them are even 4,096 features or more. And, and so you can imagine, uh, depending on what your use case is, you might need more features of something or more detail or try to figure out what the meaning is. So let's take a look at this, this space. Why do, I keep, why do I keep talking about this? So the reason I mentioned coordinates is because um, all these different features then become coordinates that are plotted on a graph. This is actually a a vector graph that you're looking at now. So here's the example of the word soccer. Um, it, depending on how the resolution comes through here, you notice that I've got that little dot on the top of the screen that says soccer. Off to the left is another one that says rugby, and the one below it says football. So the the, the distance between them is very meaningful to, to this whole process of turning these into numbers and plotting them. When we talk about two words or phrases or documents, or even concepts for that matter, that are close in distance in one of these um, multidimensional spaces, we actually mean that they're close in similarity. So a, a good sort of a way to think about this is if we look at sentences, for example. Sentences can also be embedded, and this is really the kind of thing that we're using when we do um, a lot of semantic searches, or if you're doing chatbots that are AI-driven, you're actually taking, um, you're embedding the entire sentence of a question, and then comparing that against um, the embeddings of the answers that are in a vector store. We'll, we'll kind of dig into how that whole mechanism works. But for right now, the idea of having something plotted on a graph and the closer in distance it is, the, the closer in similarity it is. So for example, let's say I have two phrases. You see, I got a couple of phrases here. Hello, how are you today? And how are you doing? Those are very similar in meaning to us, at least in the English language, right? So they would be plotted in a very similar place. You'd actually see them very close to each other if you were looking at a multidimensional space graph. Uh, at the same time, if this helps kind of drive the point home, two of the exact same phrases, hello, how are you today? And hello, how are you today? are actually in the exact same location. As a matter of fact, they have no distance at all. So anything that has no distance between them means they are entirely similar. So the closer they are, the more similar. The further away, the less similar. So the, the interesting thing about converting these meanings and identifying the features as we're doing the conversion and then mathematically representing them is that we can mathematically determine the distance between things. So this is how we can come up with a numeric value that tells us how similar different things are, words, phrases, documents, are to other words or phrases or documents. So the real takeaway here is the closer the distance, the more features or word or phrase semantically have in common. That's really the principle between all of these. And so calculating those distances and searching for those distances is how we can mathematically determine how uh, semantically similar words or phrases are to each other. Now, what does that have to do with vectors? Well, the numbers themselves are vectors, and you might have heard the uh, terminology of vector databases. This is where we actually store them. We store them in vector databases. Now, FileMaker isn't really a vector database, but it does have the ability to store vectors in a container field. So this is what you've been hearing about. That's like one of the uh, capabilities that was necessary to allow for semantic searching inside FileMaker, for example. So now you can actually create vectors, which we'll talk about how that happens in a second, using these embedding models, store them, uh, the representation of a word from another field or a phrase or a, a chunk of text from another field in a container field, and then be able to search in that container field. So you're, you're searching for vectors. You're comparing vectors to vectors and seeing which ones have the closest distance. Or if there's any that are, you know, seeing which ones are the closest is probably the best way to look at it. So um, the thing is, though, what FileMaker's not doing natively is creating the vectors for us. We need something called an embeddings model to be able to do that. And... Um, and there, and so uh, there are some embedding models that uh, some there's some really popular ones. Like the probably the the single most popular one is one from OpenAI that's called Ada. And <clears throat> I'm going to show you actually where you can find an, a seemingly unlimited amount of different models because I'm I'm really passionate about finding the right model for the right job that goes for language models or um, or embedding models for that matter. And um, these decisions are kind of interesting because not all embedding models are the same because not all embedding models can create the same amount of vectors or they don't have the same amount of dimensions is another way to kind of think about this. So sometimes, um, depending on what the task is that you're doing, you might need more vectors, you might need fewer vectors. So you want to actually pick the model that is appropriate to that. So one of the ways, if you guys are not familiar with this yet, um, actually, I'm going to pull up the live version of this real quick so I can show this to you. So this is a, I'll put this in the chat. This is the Hugging Face leaderboard for, um, they call it the, uh, the it's the MTEB leaderboard. It's the Massive Text Embedding Benchmark. And by the way, the concept of leaderboards on huggingface.co, 
um, is very meaningful in the AI space because uh, when new models come out, uh, they go through all these benchmark testings. They all have the same type of testing that they go through and new models get posted on these leaderboards. And it's kind of like an independent um, audit of the model and its capabilities to kind of help you understand, well, what is this model good at? And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can evaluate embeddings models here in just a moment. But it's really important when it comes to uh, evaluating language models and their capabilities too, like open source models or some of the, the you know, more commodity cloud-based ones. Um, so they're not all the same. That's really the takeaway here. And while the embeddings models, here you see the most popular embedding model. This is ADA or ADA. Um, which we do have support for. In FileMaker, you see some of the properties of it. You'll notice here that we don't have uh, model size and parameters for those or memory usage, which I'm going to get to in a second. And that's because those are obfuscated from us. These are um, hosted and, um, and the parameters are not always uh, revealed for uh, like open, these are open AI's models. But some of the other ones that you see here, we do have uh, values in there. And those are because these are <clears throat> um, open source models or these are published uh, when these models are actually uh, uh, produced. So when it comes to finding the right embedding models, so first off, uh, the rule that we're all getting used to in FileMaker is that when you choose an embedding model, that model also has a formula as to how the vector distances are determined. So, for example, um, if you use an embedding model that was trained with uh, cosine similarity, that's one of the formulas that are used, or Euclidean, that's like my favorite word, one of my favorite words, Euclidean distance, you have to actually make sure that you're using a model that is, if you're, if you're embedding using a cosine model, you have to evaluate using a cosine model. And anytime you change the formula, cosine, Euclidean, whatever it might be, then you actually have to do your embeddings again. So that's one of the important things that you're thinking about is maybe finding models or knowing at least what the model's um, training um, uh, parameters were. So the other thing is like how useful these are going to be for you. So um, kind of looking at when uh, converting text into uh, numbers and then storing them, let's say, in our FileMaker database is largely a set it and forget it task. So for example, if you have um, a new database with 20,000 records in it, and you want to make a notes field uh, available for semantic search, you will have to run all 20,000 of those records through an embedding model, and you'll get a bunch of vectors in return. I'll show you what they look like here in, in one of my demonstrations in a second. And then you'll store those in a container field. Now, the thing that that the user, when, when, you, when somebody's searching, um, well, okay, so you'll do that one time, you'll do all 20,000, but then you have to have a mechanism that anytime a record changes or gets added, uh, then you're going to have to run those embeddings on just that single record or that batch of records to make sure that these things are in sync. So keep in mind that embeddings, um, you might need to refresh them if your data changes or um, add new ones if you get, add new records. So you're going to have to build this into your workflow. The other thing that a lot of, of folks miss, like if you just look at semantic search, for example, the question or the, the criteria that a user is entering into a, a search field also needs to be embedded. So that's how we do the matches. We actually turn the words that somebody's searching for in a semantic search into numbers. And then we we see um, how what's the closest distance of matching vectors in the, like I mentioned here, the notes fields. So we might find some that are, um, that like actually every uh, embedding, this is probably worth noting, uh, ha will have a similarity to it. We'll have a distance to it. Some of them just might be so far away they're not useful. And one of the nice things about like a cosine formula, and there's a couple other ones too, is that the values that, that we get back are actually like a point something, like <clears throat> they're less, they're uh, from zero to one. So we'll get like a 0.76 or a 0.92. And while it's not truly mathematically accurate, I think when it's okay to think of it this way, um, that if something is a 0.76 distance, if if you're, if uh, one of your answers in your um, in your vector database is 0.76 in distance in your calculation that you're doing, your cosine calculation from the question, that means it's 76% of a match or similar, or there's a match there, right? So the idea is um, all the rest of those 20,000 notes or whatever, maybe 0.01 in similarity or 0.3 in similarity. So it's really important to really understand the idea of an acceptable threshold <clears throat> when it comes to um, what matches are going to be useful for you. And I'm going to show you guys an example how 
um, you can arrive at those uh, thresholds and uh, different mechanisms that you can use to to add a little bit of science to that whole process. But before I get into that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, what we're looking at here when you're actually picking a model. So um, just a little bit of a pro tip because we sort of uh, created a bit of a, a way to look at these things. The way we look at the right model for the right job is one of the important ones, and you only get this with the open source models, but if you're evaluating open source models, this is a great metric. Go to this leaderboard. And the first thing to look at is how much memory usage it, it takes to actually create the embeddings, because <clears throat> these are gigabytes. If you pick the Grit LM mix of experts, 8x7b, that means that you're going to need 173 gigabytes of memory just to go through the uh, the embedding process. And for those of you that are uh, working with um, setting up servers and infrastructure, you know that that is certainly no joke. So we like to find some, because especially if you're going into production with this, even if you have a dedicated machine or some really high powered instance, you really want to have these very low. So uh, we like to go down into the single digits, sort of get into this range. If we're actually doing, um, you know, if we're co-locating a server, if we're responsible for, for the instance. So my pro tip would be find a good single digit or low single digit uh, memory usage, and then the embeddings dimensions themselves. Now, I thought when I first was introduced to embeddings that the more dimensions, the better, right? Everything's better. The more expensive, the better the quality and the uh, the bigger the number, you know, the faster it goes or whatever. Not true. Um, 30, I'll just tell you right now, 30,000, if you pick that model right there and you said, Chris said to go with the low memory usage, but you ignored the fact that you have 30,000 dimensions, you could arguably turn a one megabyte FileMaker database, I don't know how much data you'd have in it, into a hundred gigabyte FileMaker database just by simply creating this much data and then storing it back in your database. So the um, embedding dimensions themselves, you got to find a sweet spot for how many dimensions you really need for the task. And I can tell you that it has been our experiment that the 768 embedding range, really the 300 range, my team continues to tell me, the 384 is technically what it is, range is perfectly acceptable for any kind of retrieval tasks that you're doing, uh, standard chatbots, question answering, and uh, semantic search as well, too. That's just, you know, kind of from the, uh, the front lines, what we're thinking about. The other part that's a really important part of it is max tokens. And you're probably familiar with uh, max tokens if you've been working with language models for some time, because um, it used to be a big deal to see what the maximum amount of tokens that essentially tokens are the unit of measure in your conversation that you're having in your API calls to the language models, both the uh, amount of data that you're sending to and the amount of data that you're getting back. So for example, if you tried to send 4,000 tokens of data to a language model, for example, that had a 3,096 um, uh, max tokens limit, it's not getting all of your data over to the model, or maybe it has a max tokens on return and you might max out the tokens by sending data over and then you have no tokens left for your return. Those are the kind of things you're thinking about from a language model perspective. And those considerations are similar here as well too. It's mostly just like this model right here would not only have so many embedding dimensions and just not enough tokens that I would ignore how appealing this might look from a memory usage standpoint. Um, Oh, before I move on from this hugging pace, face leaderboard, I'll pause for a moment and see if anybody has any questions or comments on this. <clears throat> um, I'll jump Please. in with a question. Yeah, Tony, go ahead. So um, before I ask the question, uh, true story, when I went to college, I went for math. Uh, I jumped over calculus, bad mistake, didn't remember anything. I uh, walked into a course, which was uh, the guy was talking about multidimensional vectors or vectors in multi and dimensional cool. vectors. Um, and then I switched to economics. Uh, but it wasn't is, because it, of that, though, that you switched, right? <laughs> well, you know, I, I crammed calculus in a short period of time, which is not a good way to retain learning. And then I jumped into this course and, I, you know, I just made a pivot. But anyway, that's just. A little bit of a humor story, maybe. The uh, is it my understanding? Because I'm kind of following along at home. I'm reading about vectors that the embeddings and the dimensions. You know, normally most of us think in terms of uh, three dimensions, perhaps four if you count time. And then you get into mathematics, you have uh, n dimensions, right? Which is a big infinite number. And um, I watched the beginning of the example, which was, to my eyes, anyhow, was a three-dimensional rotating plot of objects and this and that. So I don't think I'm going to be able to understand this in the next uh, in the next hour or so, but maybe my question is useful to in general. 
Uh, basically, is the underlying mathematics um, reliant on the field of mathematics and dimensional vector spaces? Is that when you when you had the chart up there a moment ago that said embeddings, uh, and it was three hundred? Is that basically are they talking about modeling things in um, three hundred dimensions, or is it a more simpler construct where any two given points can be related to each other through you said distance, which relates to similarity? Um, so maybe that question made sense and, uh, hopefully your answer makes more sense. It, uh, it does. Um, uh, so each individual vector is a, a plot point on a quadrant. So just to give you an idea, this, this, although this looks really crowded and very busy, this is just a very filtered down version of just 300 dimensions. So imagine, and this is actually just I think I just completely cleared it just to the plot, plot, plot points on this one. So it absolutely, when we say multidimensional space, we're absolutely talking about, you know, it does, it's obviously three dimensional in this like visual representation that we're doing here. But, the, but really these dimensions are going, you know, all the way down the street, for example, right? Like they're just like complete, completely enormous amounts of, of plot points and, and all for us to be able to determine the actual distance, I'm not going to call it physical distance, but the actual distance between these plot points. So what I've conveniently done here is narrowed it down to 300 to make it actually just somewhat visible, cleared most of them out, and I'm showing it to you in this rotating version and then purposely stopping so that we can actually see the relationship between these things without it moving around. So that space, I mean, I, I think it's kind of visually fascinating, but it's even more if you just think about like there's websites you can go to. I should have had one queued up here um, <clears throat> where you can actually play around with these vector uh, graphs and it, it you, you can see like how dense these can get and like, you know, wh what the actual visual of a multidimensional space looks like. And I would say that's an important part of the understanding vectors journey. Um, if I once I'm done here, I'll try to figure it out. I actually think I have it on one of my screens in here somewhere, but I, I won't bore you all with uh, digging around to find the source. But I think you guys, it, it's actually kind of an educational, fun experiment to be able to play around with that. So, yeah, that that was helpful. So it, it is n-dimensional. Um, and obviously... Well, it's uh, as many dimensions as the dimensions in the, the embedding model that you use to create it. So technically, you could have an n dimensions well, and, and, model? and I think n means just flexible one to n or something. And, and, yeah. the, and I did pick up on what you were saying is that there's, um, there's a computational cost associated with going beyond that. And then, of course, Big you're time. not able to present a visualization in two dimensions of n dimensions. So I think your visual anyway, it all it all makes sense to me. I got to brush up on my n dimensional vector math. Uh, don't we all? Uh, so I guess the good news is, is, um, I can tell you from having played around with this and tried a bunch of different ones. The good news is that 300 dimensions gets you a lot of, of, of functionality. And if you just uh, do the thought experiment of just try to sit down and write down 300 features of anything, any word concept or whatever, you'll find out how uh, sophisticated that actually is. So um, we've yet to run into a use case where we need anything that's in like the 4,000 range, but these these definitely exist. As a matter of fact, um, you can see that there's even the 30,000 uh, uh, token one. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really important to take away from is there are tons of different embedding models that are trained to do specific things. I'm going to show you some examples of pairing so these are sort of the families of the different uh, various different models that are represented in the MTEB uh, leaderboard that I just showed you. But, um, you know, these ideas of clustering should make sense to all of us. Summarization should make sense. Classification. These are some of those classic um, uh, modeling uh, 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 ideas and concepts and features or functionality that I talked about before when I was looking, when I was realizing, oh, yeah, most of what I'm doing is is classifying or summarizing or... or um, well, not pairing that that came along later for me, but uh, uh, clustering, uh, and these models are are optimized for that. So these are just some examples of some of the models that do this. Just so you can see that you should really, you know, think about what it is that you're trying to do. I'm going to show you some ex specific examples, like of of what pairing would mean. For example, uh, sometimes you just need to do clustering. You just need to get stuff, um, you know, grouped. Uh, so start with what the overall feature of a model is. Then go look at what all the different models that you have are. Find that sweet spot of the, the right amount of dimensions, and just really kind of evaluate it from when you're in production. You know how much uh, technical overhead that's going to require from hosting or generating these uh, vectors in the first place, and then you'll have your your perfect model. So um, 
So uh, uh, the the Ada one is sort of like a general, um, you know, kind of one size fits all model. It's really kind of it's actually very good for retrieval, which is really what we're basically doing when we're doing uh, semantic searches. We're retrieving the answer based on um, a semantic match. So um, that and also it's very cheap. Uh, cost is another thing to consider, and that's a very cheap one. And it's actually pretty fast. Now I should. Note that OpenAI has come out with a couple of other more advanced uh, models that were based on GPT-4 training, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, you know, they're a little bit more expensive, but uh, we found that ADA, ADA really does the trick for us. So, uh, and also open source, most of these that you're looking at here are open source models, but open source's uh, options are very good uh, for embedding use cases. And it might make sense for you to actually do the embedding locally on your machine if you have enough compute. If the dimensions make sense and you need to, you know, continue, continually create these uh, on the fly within within your workflow efforts. So what are we talking about when we're talking about these different use cases? So this is where I want to move on to um, talking about some of the cool things that we can do with vectors. So um, really the whole concept behind, you know, vec the, the, the using vectors is we're matching things. We're taking two different things and finding out that they're very similar. But here's what's kind of fascinating. So I'll take a concept that I think everybody understands, and it's translations. And what was really fascinating to me, and by the way, the caveat here is that um, what I'm about to say is only true if the embedding model that you chose is actually a multilingual model. That's another one of your decision-making factors is if you embed where um, it has multilingual support, well, then you can do something cool like this. Here's a fascinating vector thought. The the word the phrase this is red actually is 92% similar in the vector space with this model, this multilingual model, to the Spanish interpretation, esto es rojo. I don't remember what language that was on the on C, but you can see that um translating or actually something in a completely different language is actually similar in meaning. And the only reason they're not 100% because it's the same phrase is just the construct of language. It's actually kind of a fascinating thing to just sort of sit and think about. Like, we can communicate with other people when we translate, but we're not always like 100% capturing the same meaning. And a lot of times it has to do with the fact that just like some languages don't have this, a word for what we're trying to express or the sentence structure for what we're trying to express. But if you can get 92% similar, like that's a good translation. So why... Why, you know, we all know you can go into like ChatGPT and ask it to translate something for you, or you could have done that in like Google um, Translate. So why is scoring the quality of translation so important? Well, here is an interesting um, experiment you can all do. You can go into ChatGPT and um, ask it to write a letter to someone that speaks Spanish and say, I need to write a letter to somebody. They speak Spanish, and this is what I want to get across in my letter. Then you'll see it does this incredible job within just a few seconds that it writes your letter in Spanish and essentially translated what you had said into, um, into the language that you're trying to convert. Now what I would like you to do, you can do it now or later, but copy that letter that's in this language that you don't understand. Go open up another conversation in ChatGPT, paste that in, and now say convert this to English. You will be fascinated by how not what you said it actually is. And it's not that there's something wrong with the model. This is how translation works. As a matter of fact, go do that same experiment with um, uh, Google Translate, and you'll find out that those are not even close. They get the point across, but they're not even close. And I'll share a funny anecdote that I learned this the hard way myself. Um, I mean, I was familiar with this concept, but but this thought experiment came about because um, um, uh, uh, our gardener, who's a fantastic gardener, is, is, is like a, a true arborist. Um, but we've never had a conversation because we have a language barrier. And so I have this little patch of grass that's a memorial for one of our, our dogs. So we, you know, we put this special seed of grass and we, we spread our dog's ashes down there. And I wanted to say to him, hey, you don't need to seed that grass, right? Like, don't, don't come and put other seed in there because this is like a, a pristine, you know, little patch of grass. So I wrote it. I wrote the letter. And then I go, well, what's the tone of this letter? And I put, it, I did the same thing I just shared with you guys. And it was like, oh, good day, good sir. Well, next time you're near that patch of grass over yonder, then you should. And I was like, oh, this isn't how I talk at all, right? So I, I went through it a couple of times and I said, change the tone and here's a dialect and it's, you know, Southern California, like how we, we might translate there. And finally I got it to like the chef's kiss and I was so proud of myself. I printed the letter and I walked out to when the gardener slash arborist came to the house and I go, hey, I have this letter. Can you read this? And he reads it and he goes, 
I speak English. <laughs> so actually it was a little embarrassing for me. Um, but the point is I got to go through that experiment and you know, now we talk all the time. I don't know what the heck I was thinking. I'm such an idiot, but it really helped me understand that like translations aren't translations easily. So scoring translations is critically important if you're going to go to scale. So what I would strongly recommend is if you're in using translations in any way, shape or form that you vectorize using an embedding model, the, the original form and then it's translated form and then determine what the percent um, is. And in order to determine it. So this, for example, is the translation that we did in that. Um, uh, one of the things that we did for this customer is they were just simply doing translations and we said, no, you have to score the translation. So this is kind of how we do it. We say we take the, the, the text that's being translated. Uh, we come up with it. We vectorize the input and the output, compare the two. We determine if it met the threshold or not. If not, we go back again, sometimes with um, the actual score and maybe some, some feedback that the language model can give us on why it scored so poorly. And, um, and um, and then also uh, we then we end up if it is above a threshold we actually display that to the user. So let me tell you how we establish a threshold because I think this is really cool. So the way we establish what an acceptable threshold was because it's not the same depending on your use cases. Like we've got some deployments that the acceptable threshold of a match of something is like a 0.75. Or we have some where the acceptable threshold has to be in the mid 90s, right? So the way that you determine what's acceptable is you get humans involved. You may hear the concept of uh, humans in the loop or um, <clears throat> reinforcement learning with humans in the loop. That's what this concept is. And it's really kind of a genius uh, way um, to you know introduce alignment into your uh, AI techniques. And so here's an example of what we did. We actually um, went into a pilot um, a couple years back, where we took uh, the English version of just the name of a product in this case, and then we converted it using, I think it was just GPT-3 or 3.5 at the time. And we did a Spanish version and a Portuguese version. And then we took like 200 of these. And you see on the bottom, um, we've got various different scoring, one to 10, one to 10 scoring. We, we thought it was meaningful to figure out if the overall translation was good, if the context, if it was technically accurate, if it was consistent, and maybe any kind of notes, right? So we sent this to actual, you know, luckily this is a global organization. So we sent it down to some people um, in their Latin America division who actually understood English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And we sent it to like, I think it was a dozen people, the more the better, of course, but we had about a dozen testers. And what they did was score whether this was a good Spanish translation. Okay. Uh, get all that information back. Now, here's the interesting thing. Behind the scenes for each Spanish and Portuguese translation, we also had the semantic score. This is how I like to refer to it as semantic scoring. Not even really sure if that's a real thing, but uh, let's make it a thing. Semantic scoring is what we're really talking about doing here. So the whole idea is that the user's not seeing that that might have been a 0.73 and the Portuguese one is a 0.82. They're just giving us their scores. So what we do is we get all these 200 back then we look, then we compare what a human said was a really good translation. And then we're able to find the correlation between, um, we're essentially able to go, well, if we if we say that eights and nines and above are acceptable, then we see that that correlates with about a point, I think this was actually like a 0.76 or something was our threshold and higher. So then what we're able to do is now we don't need humans to do this. We go through this a few times to make sure that we're getting the same results. Now we can actually go to scale. So now they can use this in production on their 1 million SKUs and have confidence that the translations are accurate because we've already had humans tell us what's accurate and we're able to mathematically determine what humans think is an acceptable translation in various different languages. So this is the concept of trans, uh, uh, scoring your translations and also an excellent use case of vectors and embeddings that really has nothing to do with search. So um, I'll pause for a moment and see if you all have any questions on translations because frankly, the whole thing's really fascinating to me. The moment I discovered that an English phrase and that's translated Spanish were even somewhat close to each other. That kind of blew my mind for a bit. So I'll pause for a moment and see if anybody has any questions or comments on that. Mind's blown. Totally get it. I've been there. Um, so let's look at another way that we can <clears throat> uh, use these embeddings. So this one was really fast. This one was super fascinating to me. This was a uh, um, a marketing project that we were working on. And, and um, I, I performed an experiment where what I did was I went on um, one of these data repository uh, sites. One second. 
specifically this website called Kaggle. So for all of us the data nerds that aren't familiar yet with Kaggle, it's K-A-G-G-L-E. It's just where all these data science uh, people go on and they share their experiments and their models, but even better, data sets. So I wanted my hypothesis this one Saturday, because we needed to figure out if this was possible uh, for a project, was can I match a customer stating a need for a product or service that they are looking for and a solution, or in this case, a solution was a uh, company um, giving sort of a, a, a tagline of what their product or service is. And can I match those? And and this was really important. We're in the FileMaker world, we would just do a search, right? We would do a keyword search or what is referred to as a lexical search. That doesn't cut it when it comes to like truly pairing needs and solutions. So in this case, you can see they don't really have obvious keywords in 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 common. This is why a semantic pairing is really the only way you could actually achieve this. So what I did is I was able to find a data set of like 10,000, uh, you know, for something that somebody was doing. They were actually two different data sets. One was um, for the customers stating a need. And then the other one was a company talking about themselves. I think it was like a marketing thing or something. And then I ran them all. I, I embedded them with the same model which was a pairing model, and then determined uh, what an acceptable threshold was. So the cool thing is you can actually match needs and solutions. And I'll show you a little bit later where we did something similar where we were doing, um, I'll, I'll give you a little, I'll show you a little screenshot of it, at least of a, of a uh, 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 trouble ticket matching to be able to determine whether, you know, which of these uh, most likely outcomes um, are, are the correct answer to the trouble ticket for the consumer so it can get routed. It's basically, so AI is doing like level one support and it kind of just goes right to level two uh, with that match. So um, that's another example of it. So pairing, need solution pairs, really fascinating. Um, this whole concept of matching sort of opposites is really fascinating to me. And actually, if you think really hard about it, um, doing uh, chat bots, so I don't know, maybe, maybe in case anyone's unaware, it's kind of fascinating. A chat bot, the whole you type in a question and the answers come out, especially if you're doing retrieval, um, which means you're actually searching another data source for the answer and then feeding that to the language model where it just it, it takes on the task of uh, turning that into um, uh, an answer. That's actually more akin to a pairing match. Uh, through embeddings than it is a uh, semantic search uh, to, to some degree because they're kind of the opposite. The the uh, the the uh, question is really uh, could be the opposite of a, of an answer uh, depending on what the nature of it is, or it could just be the completion. So I don't know. It's just kind of a fascinating sort of thought experiment if you think about that's what's actually going on behind the scenes. Technically, when you're doing a chat, you you vectorize the. Um, the question that the person asked using the same embed embeddings model is all your previously vectorized answers, and you're just finding the acceptable match above a certain threshold. And when you're working inside FileMaker with these, you, you see that you can get record counts back. Record counts aren't that meaningful other than that you just have to process a lot less data. Like you might, you might just say, only give me all the state of California ones, and then I'll see within those whether I have a match. That's really what that's for. But but figuring out what the threshold is, and you can use the cosine function in FileMaker to be able to determine what the threshold is, that's really what you want to do. You really want to say, go run a search, give me it back all of all, you know, whatever my constraint set is that I'm doing the search against. And then within that, determine the cosine similarity above a certain threshold through your own uh, human in the loop testing that is acceptable for this task. And that's the, the ones that you actually show to the user or the ones that you use uh, in your chat answer, for example. Okay, so this one is going to be a little bit more in-depth. I'm going to click through certain phases of it. I'm really proud of this one. This is an, ex well, another before I get into the demonstration, um, I talked about this concept at DevCon, uh, which I was really fascinated by, which was, okay, if we can do pairs, needs, and solutions, well, what about if we do resumes and job postings? To me, it was just like this fascinating, like, wow, what if we could do that? Um, 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 you know, use use that to do what I think is like sort of like, you know, a a a, a blind trial matching. Like we take all of the bias out of our decision making to find the right individual for the right job, and to me, using these techniques would would be you know so much more profoundly fair and accurate than maybe any other way that we could use to, to do this. So, 
Um, I, I talked about this, uh, like, so because the reason that would be useful is because you can, you're really looking for, for synonyms. So like, like if you vectorize an entire resume and vectorize an entire job posting document and determined what the similarity was between the two of them, you would be able to leverage really important things like looking for, um, you could account for synonyms. It won't even, who cares if there's any keywords in there? Um, you could do things like, uh, there'd be nuance in there. Like, um, uh, you might have a job that was, is seeking somebody with good communication skills and it would still match a resume that, for example, said they had excellent written and verbal abilities, let's say, or even though the resume never mentions communica sk com communication or skills, it might still actually match because somebody says they have good written and verbal uh, abilities. So to me, I thought that was just so impactful when it came to um, uh, matching jobs. And then there's also nuances, like you can actually determine within the data things that are like junior uh, job levels versus a senior job position. And those kind of nuances could be reflected in the embeddings and the matchings that you're doing. So ultimately I felt, and as I was talking about this in Engage, that semantic matching approach can be uh, can find deeper relevance between candidates and job postings um, than really humans could ever do, just simply leveraging keyword searches uh, for themselves. And then after that, someone came up to me the next day and they said, oh my God, I literally came to this conference because I work for a job placement company and I was sent here to figure out how we could maybe leverage AI in our FileMaker system where we do this. This is all fully obfuscated. This is not client's data. Um, this is just sort of the same type of things that we went through. But um, so we engaged with this with this organization. We said, okay, we'll do that exact same thing. We're going to do the thing that I, I hypothesized on uh, just a moment ago, which was vectorize the entire um, uh, uh, job positions. They call it position specifications and the entire resume and see if we can match them. So let me talk you through um, not only how we ended up doing that, but then these two other methodologies that we came up with during the experiment process that by the way, really speak to why you should perform experiments ahead of time, because um, I'll, I'll just tell you, uh, the whole idea of vectorizing an entire resume and vectorizing an entire job position did not really give meaningful matches, as I, I originally hypothesized. But because we went through that experiment, um, it shed light on a couple other approaches we could take. And I'm really proud to share those approaches with you here in a second. So let's take a look at this um, case study here. This is a job resume matching for one of these uh, customer deployments that, I talk, that I'm talking about here. And we're doing semantic matching in three different me non-traditional methods. So the first method that I want to show you is exactly the one I've been talking about. We extracted the text from each position description. That's the PDF that you see on the left in a container field. And we, we extracted the text from that. That's the text that we extracted from the document that you see in the middle. And we're using language models to do the extraction. By the way, they're very good at doing what we've commonly known as OCR. And then on the right, that's it. That's vectors. That's Those are what vectors look like. And you, there's um, a big string, uh, string of these coordinates all separated by commas. And you can see that we have more vectors, more dimensions in this model than, I mean, I could click into that and scroll. And by the way, this we were just doing 300 dimensions and this file just was ridiculously huge i think it was it literally went from like five megabytes to like five gigs or something like that so it's it's not without consequence so the theory was now we're going to go do the same thing so we're going to go over to the this is the the job description now we're going to go over to all the resumes that are in the database and it had tens of thousands of resumes so imagine the storage cost if you get the dimensions wrong. So we go over into the, um, well, there you see the the vectors. Um, and so then I go over into the, oh, there we go. Uh, over into the resumes, we do the same thing. We take the PDF of every resume, we go one record at a time, we extract the text from it, vectorize the, the text, and then store the vectors in, we were using a different vector database, but in FileMaker, this would not be a text field, this would be a container field that contains the vectors. Then what we did is we, semantically matched. Um, you see the value that you see in the field up on the top. It says 0.6 or 0.46. That means that this resume is a is 46% of a match of the job description. And so you could just do some, you know, and that would be like which how you would um use the uh, cosine function, for example. And so of course, you know, we would go through some process with the with the humans. Uh, and do some reinforcement learning and determine what the threshold was. But right out of the gate, we saw that 
I think most of them didn't even ex exceed uh, like 0.5. So we knew already that e even if we determined that, you know, the best we could get is a 0.56, like it's probably not going to be a very good match. So that immediately got us thinking, all right, glad we performed this experiment before we just went into production on this. Um, we should come up with some other approaches. And I'm really proud of these other approaches. So this one, I think there's a lot. If you really think really hard about this approach, you can you can uh, you figure out how you can actually use this in similar manners for yourself. So, so the next phase that we did, we did something that's called ontology mapping. This was just a, a ontology. You guys might be familiar with this, but um, in English, it's really break the information down into meaningful and describable pieces. So this actually came up as a thought bubble when we were talking to the client, and they said, "Well, you know, when we um um oh sh shit um." But anyways, don't look at the whole screen. I just realized something. But um, it's not any personal data is being shared or anything. So we were having a conversation with them and they said, well, when we in when we when our customers come to our website and we do the intake of the job, we're actually they're actually filling out seven different fields. And I was like, wait, hold on. You mean every job position has seven, seven different breakdowns and you just put those together into one big position description? And they're like, yeah, exactly. So I go, oh, this is great. So you already have a workflow that supports comp compartmentalizing or breaking down a job description into me more meaningful um, little pieces. They said, yeah, absolutely. So it's exactly what we did here. We, instead of taking one big block of text, we created their different groups, the responsibilities of the position, qualifications, you see measure success, institutional overview, all the way down to essentially creating more granular. Now, um, how do we do that? Well, we actually created a very sophisticated prompt and used a language model for this. So, uh, well, actually, uh, we did it on the, I'm sorry, on the resume side. On this side, this is literally how they input the, the data, right? So, as I mentioned, we actually go over to the resume side. Now, this is the part where it was really hard. This is where we need the language model. A job position breaks down into these seven categories, but a resume doesn't necessarily very cleanly break down into these seven categories, but we needed it to. Because ultimately what we were going to do is use those same seven categories, populate them. I'll talk about how we did that in a second. And then individually vectorize each one of those fields. So the numbers that you're seeing in the score, so to speak there, are how each section matches over to the original job description. So why is that Why is that meaningful? Well, well, the, the first thought was maybe we get more accuracy. But the other thought was if we end up having something that's a 0.83 match like let's put it this way you could have two resumes that are a 0.83 match but for completely different reasons and the the thought was well maybe the job it's more important to the job the people who are trying to place the job about their measures of success being match matching or the qualifications are being more important so i thought First of all, I'd like to know why these are matching so let's break it down into the smallest pieces of data vectorize and match those smallest pieces of data and then I'll show you how we normalize that in, in just a second. And we gave the client, uh, we give the, this approach gives the client the opportunity to um, weight uh, the different jobs so that their customers can then say which parts of this particular job placement are more important than the others, for example, right? So first, how did we actually populate these fields? We used uh, sophisticated prompts and language models to do it. And that's really hard, actually. It wasn't so hard to um, write the prompt. It did take uh, several tries, as any good prompting exercise does. And the prompts are like, you know, two and a half pages long or something like that. But this is something that a human just could not do. Uh, if if I gave, you guys are all very smart people. Um, if I gave you this task, you could probably do one or two or three of them, just kind of like pretzel logic in your brain around like, well, what part of this might actually be the responsibilities? But you definitely couldn't do 12,000 of them, right? And you couldn't do this in, in, the, in the middle of a workflow. So another excellent use case for language models that you just simply could not do. And you even if you could, you just couldn't do it at the scale necessary to be able to do this in a real work environment. So we use language models to break them all down. We, we break down the responsibilities of the position on the resumes, responsibilities of the position on the job position, vectorize each one of those, and then we do a match between each individual one. So that ends up telling us what the matches are of the individual sections shows us which sections are a higher match, like qualifications and characteristics of su successful candidate are clearly the highest match in this group. But there was one more step to this that that I thought, oh, I, I know exactly how we can resolve this. What we did was 
we created weights. So um, this is a, I'm sure you guys are nodding along. Weighting is just a classic, you know, machine learning uh, technique. Um, in particular, um, when I was talking about those like uh, silly fantasy football um, machine learning models from that I was using back in the day, those were regression models. And the whole reason I even discovered machine learning is because you can't do regression in FileMaker. Um, and so I you know, found somebody at a sports conference was like, you can't do a regression in, in this tool you're using, but I can create a model for you, but we're going to have to run it in something else that can support regression. And it's similar to the regression that we think about with, um, um, like if we're looping through data and we're compounding or something like this, but a little bit different. Um, ultimately what I learned, so, so if your instinct was when you saw all the different scores to go, hey, let's just create an average of those which was what my instinct was when I was doing the football stuff back in the mid 2000s. Well, don't ever say that to a data scientist because they'll say averages. Oh, what are you talking about? Forget averages. So weighting is actually the more superior technique. So instead of actually averaging up what all the scores are and coming up with one average score, what you do is you go back because you don't know. And the reason in this case, it doesn't make sense is because we don't know the, the client who hired this company to fill this position, we want to give them an opportunity to tell us which parts of this document are are more important than others in the this particular placement activity. So pre presenting them with weights is an excellent way to do it. So it, you'll notice that all these weights that you see, all those values, that equals up to um, like a one or 100, right? So that's ultimately how you weight it. You spread those across, um, you spread those across the weight. As a matter of fact, we were just, this just came up in a standup this morning where the customer wanted to take like four sections of an email that was being authored. And depending on where they were in the sales cycle, they might emphasize step number two more than step number four or something. So they said, well, can we just make those longer? And we, I said, um, no, you don't want to just make it more longer. You, In order to truly emphasize it, you want to be able to use weights. So what you would do is you would say, well, for this particular uh, sales uh, uh, thing, I want to emphasize step three instead of step two or something. And then you just make the weights higher on that one. But the key with using weights is that it's relative. So in order to make to emphasize one area, you have to de-emphasize another area. And so here, that meant that we really maintain a level of overall meaning or value, and then we were actually distributing it through weights. But we're not done yet. We can't just average uh, the weights. We actually use those weights in a, an actual regression model. This is what it, uh, it's a little fuzzy, but this is what a regression model looks like. Super easy to do if you don't know how to do a regression model. Whip open ChatGPT, and in the time it took me to tell you to whip open ChatGPT, it can create a regression model almost uh, error-free because it's they're so easy and so common that I created this model to, um, and we can just run this as an API or we could we could even easily create one in CoreML and just run it in the, in the same session in the background if these are Mac users, which these guys are actually. So the point is now that 0.55 that you see there is actually still a single score that we determine the match of a resume and the job position, but it's weighted. So we were able to allow the humans to tell us which parts are more valuable and it's taking into account which parts of the job description are more valuable and matching on those and still giving us the breakdown of the individual scores so we can see where the matching came from. So very excited about this breaking it down into little bits. That's really the takeaway. Break things down into smaller bits, vectorize them. And if you need to compile it all back together, I would suggest exploring potentially using weights and regression to be able to get back to a single score. Now, there was one other step, and this one is a lot less complicated and has a lot less math in it. And it's kind of a cool um, <clears throat> um, concept. And these are called ideal matching. And this one, we use, we use in very similar... Um, uh, incarnations all the time in a lot of the AI systems that we're doing. So I strongly, ho hopefully this uh, brings a, like sounds, you know, important enough for you to pursue this in your own flavor. But what we did here was we went into the job position and used a language model to say, what, write me a profile of the ideal candidate for this job. So it has nothing to do with any of the resumes. We just say, all right, here's a job. What would be the perfect candidate for this job. Well, as it turns out, you can do that pretty easily with some sophisticated prompting by just pointing it at the job position. But then once we told the client about it, they're like, oh, we got all sorts of other documents that can help create the ideal. Like if, now that we know you're doing that, we could actually feed in this or this little interview piece that we did with the customer and da, da, da. So we go, great. Feed all those documents to the language model and tell the language model to create the ideal candidate profile. 
and you bet you guess you know what we're doing with that. Then we vectorize the ideal candidate profile. Then we go onto the other side with the resumes, you guessed it, and we do the same thing. Give us what, for this resume, what's the perfect ideal job position? I bet you a lot of people, anybody with a resume would love to see what their ideal position might be, right? But as you guessed it, take the ideal on the resume side, the ideal text on the um, on the job position side. And by the way, we have a lot of control over the output, so we can really fine tune matching the right amount of dimensions there appropriately. So um, then we just do uh, the semantic score between the two of them and find out what the ideal match score is. So these were three ways that we were presenting to the customer as to how to solve the same problem of finding the right uh, resumes for the right um, uh, use case. But this, their their feedback was fascinating. What their feedback was, was well, that we were basically saying, pick one of these three. And they said, oh, well, actually, ideal state helps us is it helps us in a totally different part of the workflow. That helps us create our long list of candidates. Cool. Okay. And then later in the process, we'll use the ontology mapping to actually do the, the mapping of the shortlist, um, all while still being able to have uh, humans in, in the process uh, to be able to, you know, overlay uh, and superimpose their expertise onto these matching uh, processes. So it was really kind of cool to see that they just didn't pick one. They go, oh, well, this process will be good in this step of the workflow. This one will be good in another step of the workflow and so on and so on. Any questions about this use case? There's a lot going on here. So any comments or anything similar that you guys are doing that you might want to offer? All right. I'll so the, so the, yeah. um, the ideal match score, that's that's the, that's the best it would do then, right? Uh, you mean the, um, the, the numerical value itself? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that was our highest. Um, I, I'm pretty confident it wasn't our highest because we were pretty satisfied with it. I think in this just particular record, it happens to show us 60 yeah. because that's what that match was. So, um, but I can tell you it was definitely higher. It was probably higher than this because the original one was only give us in the 50s and we immediately rejected that. So I'm pretty confident that we're getting higher scores here as and, well. And, and it wouldn't matter if you rearrange the entire uh, resume, it would still be able to pick out everything that it needed. Correct. To which is what's so cool about these language models, right? Like they can they can evaluate the entire document. They don't care about the order. I mean, as long as you have enough, you know, this is why token windows are so important. As long as you have enough token windows to, to evaluate an entire document at once, it doesn't matter what order they're in. As a matter of fact, what's so cool about this is that while they had standardization on the job position, there's literally no such thing as standard resume. Like, you, you know, you put your contact information on the top or <clears throat> you know your education next but people just go do whatever as a matter of fact the way to game the finding a job process is to go learn um what they what they find meaningful on the hiring side and then recraft a specialized resume just for that job well you don't even have to do that here because the models can actually find the meaning that they're looking for regardless of um the construct and by the way the what the next level of this is is and we we explored this with with the customer. We said, look, ultimately at the end of the day, resumes are are just getting in the way. What you really want to do is say to your job placement people, hey, you want to get part of our system? Sure, give us a resume because we know you have one. But also, here's just an open text field that you can just word vomit into. You want to give us thirty thousand words to tell your whole life story and everything you've ever done and details about a project? Great, do it. Because all of that will actually get considered when the ideal position gets created or when the matching is getting created. So it's, it's really kind of an interesting philosophical impact that that AI can have, um, which, by the way, is why. Um, um, and yes, by the way, Heidi, absolutely, the LLM can create the resume based on the job description. But that's actually kind of what it's doing. It's the ideal. The ideal profile is technically it creating a resume based on a job position. Um um, but they don't, right. And they don't need to be the same words. That's really what the key is, is that these are just similar concepts. So you're, you're really, you're really, <laughs> you're, you're really nailing it. Yeah. And you're hired. Well done. Um, so, so really the kind of fascinating thing is like, think about, um, surveys. So this is this sort of philosophical AI thing I have about surveys. Um, I just filled out a survey this morning of some airline that I fly on sent me one and I think if anybody wants to know my opinion so much that they're going to ask for it, I'll give it to them. And I was answering a bunch of questions that were extremely deterministic because they have to provide the answers. Maybe every now and then they go, is there anything you just want to say? And they give me a little text field where I can put like a hundred words in there. And then they get all their answers back and they pretend that they discovered something by doing a survey. But I had this thought, 
my wife is a teacher. She's a, a, a brilliant double master's educator, special ed, really doing important work. Um, I'm just sitting down in the basement doing silly experiments and playing fantasy football. So um, she gets this uh, teacher's magazine to the, to the house and it was sitting on the kitchen table. And I finally looked at the cover and it said, we asked every teacher in America these questions. And of course, my immediate thought was, there's no way you asked every teacher in, in America those questions. But then I thought, what if you could? What if you could ask every teacher in, in, in America this question? Well, you would want to ask them to really understand what they want, you'd probably want to ask them to give you an essay back of what you thought about this topic. That would be the perfect use case, right? Well, why don't we do that? Well, because you would get back, let's say there's 15 million teachers, you would get back 15 million essays that some human has to process. Well, AI models can do that processing. So it immediately occurred to me, why are we bothering with deterministic surveys at all? As a matter of fact, if you really want to know how your constituents feel about a topic, send them one big text box and go, have at it, no limit. Tell us everything you want in your own words, whatever it is, and then process all of that, either semantically, extract topics from it, you know, whether you're doing matching, whatever it is. That, to me, is the future of really meaningful surveys. I know it's a little crazy and a little bit of a silly thought experiment, but... Um, that is really the same process as encouraging, instead of somebody just sending a resume, give us everything you possibly ever could tell us about yourself and maybe even a full essay on some project that you want these people to know about and have they consider that when it's when it's creating these descriptions. So just a little, you know, fun things to think about here. Um, another example where we vectorize customer support tickets, um, this is the details that you see of the support tickets on the top. We then use semantic searching and vector distances. You can see those highlighted. There's This is a different, by the way, this is an example of a different formula. This wasn't the same formula that we were using before. Um, um, sometimes, actually, if you do a lot of machine learning, you'll see that... Um, uh, you might get a one a one point seven seven, and it's actually like a, a factorial. Uh, but also, some models are actually um, from zero to two in their similarity sometimes as well too. And I think that's actually what was going on here. So this one is more of a kin of a of a similarity of seventy seven percent match. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea, if you're wondering, hey, what happened to the zero point whatevers? Uh, so sometimes it's a factorial, which you run into a lot with uh, uh, confidence in machine learning, but this one is just a different algorithm that we use. So what we did was we said, what the customer wanted to do was have uh, trouble tickets come in and we vectorize the, the the text in the trouble ticket. And then they have all these different, like um, most common uh, use cases. And, um, and then we vectorize all those. And then we're able to determine based on certain, there's a little bit more sophistication than just simply like vectorizing here, but we're essentially able to use uh, vectors and matching to determine what the most likely uh, reason is for their issue. So you see expired or cannot whatever or game, you know, I truncated those to, to clear out the data for the customer. But essentially this one is, is most likely because of an expired code, a game code expired. The other one is, um, the, the next likely one is uh, can't activate the game and so on. So this is a very like machine learning approach that leverages, um, uh, that leverages uh, vectors uh, to be able to come up with a solution. But this was a very real solution and, and actually helped them quite a bit. So uh, this example showcases probably the, the most common use case that we're all familiar with when it comes to using vectors. This is a custom web app that we developed that's used by fire marshals. Uh, the challenge was that the fire codes and regulations were constantly being updated, and they did not necessarily exist in the training data of the underlying model, which in this case we see in the bottom right-hand corner is GPT-4.0. Now, the latest fire codes are available to fire marshals through a series of national fire prevention agency documents. And for some bizarre reason, maybe because it's a government agency, the NFPA does not have an API to these standards. I don't know why, but instead they distribute documents, like multi-gigabyte size documents, by the way, um, that um, instead of actually distributing the, the, the versions. So our solution uh, for the, 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 this uh, uh, customer was to create a source of ground truth through a retrieval process where we convert all these NFPA documents into vectors and then store them in a vector database. Then the user, when they're typing in the question that they want to get answered, we vectorize the question, compare that to potential answers uh, in the vector database, and then present the, the, the matches to the user. And this is actually a big deal. Re retrieval is so important because 
I we didn't actually rely on the language models training data to answer these questions at all. We actually do a ton of instruction that's essentially prompt templating that's be, that's working behind the, the curtain. There's actually probably like 8,000 tokens worth of instruction that's happening um, just to establish this. So we are heavily involved in controlling truth and telling them telling the model, we don't care what you know, these documents know everything, but the model does important things like you know, create cool formatting or uh, decide what kind of analysis or synthesis might be necessary. So the language models are still doing important things. They just aren't responsible for truth. So in this case, and for those of you that haven't worked with uh, retrieval or chatting over documents, there's this important concept of if you take a like 600 page document, you're not vectorizing the entire 600 page document and putting it into a field, much like I, I showed you in the resume job description one, you're doing something called chunking. And I'm just using this as a reason to talk about chunking. What you're doing is you're you're breaking the document into just like we did with the ontology mapping, little, smaller, bite-sized pieces. But in the case of chunking, you're not doing breaking it into um, describable pieces like we did with the resume example. You're just breaking them into chunks. And that's just because if somebody asks a question, hey, um, What's the fire flow require? What's the minimum number of hydrants for a fire flow requirement for 1800 GPM? Well, you don't want to go find, you don't want to say, oh, we matched the six gigabyte database or the six, six gigabyte documents, and they take the entire contents of the document and then then compare the vectors to that, you're going to get the same thing that we did when we tried to brute force match the resumes with the job descriptions, right? So if you take just a little like 200 or 500 token chunk and say the answer is in there, then what we're actually doing is we're taking a tiny little chunk or multiple tiny little chunks that might all have the answer and taking those little non sequiturs of information, handing that over to the language model along with our question for it to actually um, write the answer for the user. So that's at, at its essence what retrieval is. Um, thank you, Tony. Yes, gallons per minute. And uh, so that's essentially what retrieval is. Retrieval is, or document retrieval is taking documents, breaking them into chunks and uh, vectorizing those chunks. Um, I was pretty fascinated for a long time with like how big the chunks should be um, because I, an industry standard, uh, I, I was at a meetup for, uh, I was at a lane chain meetup um, I think maybe a year ago, year and a half ago, or something, and 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 the the I was friendly with this guy Harrison Chase, who's the the guy who created Langchain, and I heard him say in this meetup, he goes, "Well, you know, we all chunk at 500 tokens a piece. Someone should really come up with a more sophisticated way to do that." And then I thought, "Oh man, intelligent chunking." So I worked with this data scientist here at I Solutions, and we we brought this over to some of his friends in academia, and we actually came up with these really like if you really need sophisticated chunking. We can actually use machine learning and language models to extract a meaningful chunk, not just a a, a 500 token chunk uh, of data. And that way, when we're actually retrieving it, we're getting a complete thought or an entire paragraph of a subject, for example. And that way, it increases um, the accuracy of our outputs that way. So um, chunking... Don't just settle for chunking at certain token sizes. Like expect more of chunking, um, which is a, a term you probably didn't expect that you were going to hear tonight. Um, so let me show you some other cool examples. Uh, but, but let's, second, oh, no, go ahead, please. About chunking. Um, yeah, please. So with the chunking, is it is it doing like hard separation by paragraph or whatever, or can it actually chunk across the entire document and say, oh, you know, there's this stuff at the beginning is similar to the stuff at the end. Let's put that all together in one chunk. Yeah. Intro would might be have similar information to a conclusion, right? Well, the good news is, let's say your intro does have similar information to the conclusion. Those will end up as, even if you do the, the, the brute force, like just the 500 ones, those will end up as separate chunks in your database. Then when a user asks a question, let's say the intro has something about GPM and the conclusion has something about GPM. When the user does their, when they do the search of the vector database or the vector search, both of those chunks will come up as matching criteria. They'll, they they might have different levels of uh, semantic relevance or similarity, um, but they'll still both show up. So it doesn't matter if you chunk them together or if they were separate, they'll still show up in your retrieval uh, file and set, I guess we could call it if we wanted to file maker term that. So your, your, your thought process is in the right spot, definitely. Uh, when I was talking about the more sophisticated version, it was not cutting something off in the middle of a thought. 
which is really what most chunking processes do. But instead, if it's like a whole page that describes GPM, I'll take the whole page instead of end up getting like five different chunks. Um, at the end of the day, you know, there's only certain use cases where that level of, of measurability is meaningful to the accuracy, but sometimes it is. So, um, but the way you're thinking about it is a good way to think about it. You're definitely tracking on this, no doubt. Um, this other use case involves image matching. Okay, I will tell you that. Um, well, first of all, let me set up the customer here. Uh, this uh, customer is a road mapping customer. It's very, they have the very similar cars to like the Google mapping cars that you can see the, the uh, but they use LiDAR. So in the upper right-hand corner, you can actually see what one of the cameras affixed to one of the, the Hummers that they use looks like. And in the middle, you actually see what they're capturing. So in this case, they care about road signs. You see one of the example road signs up on the top. They don't care about the roads themselves. They actually drive along all the highways of all the different states and they capture where all the road signs are and some level of condition, the lat launch of where the road sign was. And they ultimately have to identify what the road sign was that they captured. And you can imagine that's a lot of road signs to, to capture, right? So um, right now they have some uh, country, uh, some uh, out of country um, vendor that they use that they literally spend tens of millions of dollars to have them tag tag this stuff. So imagine how many miles of roads there are in the state of California. That's one of their customers. Then they have to have humans actually scroll through these like LIDAR images like you're seeing here and visually identify and go, oh, that looks like that might be, let's see, which one of the 480 different road sign uh, uh, styles are there? Oh, that could be a, a G486 or something like that. So they came to us saying, there's got to be a better way. We're a pretty high-tech company. We do these LiDAR things. There's got to be a better way that we could use AI to do this. So our first experiment that we did was to take um, some sample images that they captured. This is a this is literally not the LiDAR version, but the actual um, camera version of one of the signs in California that they captured. And then what we what we originally did was we used an image embedding model and we just like vectorized the image as is. And then we vectorized the training images. I'll show you an example of one of those in a second. And then we saw what kind of matching we got. And this, again, is a reason why you should do experiments before you do things in production, because we discovered that was garbage. Um, we really hoped that um, image matching would be more meaningful, but in this case, it wasn't. So what we did instead was we used a vision model. So what we did, what you're seeing on the right-hand side is the um, the uh, um, is the instructions that we're sending. This is kind of our prompt um, that, we're, that we're sending along with the image over to, in this case, I think we would use like GPT-4, like V, the vision model right now to, to interpret it, or maybe even Google Gemini. I'm fascinated with Google Gemini. Uh, it's not really good on text, but it's really amazing on image and, um, and long form video. It's like mind bendingly good at interpreting video. But in this case, we were just sending it over to GPT-4V. And what we were saying, if you read this prompt, is we're saying describe the sign. But we didn't want it to just be left to its own devices to describe the sign. We wanted to get back a JSON object with very specific values in it. So in, in oh, let's just take a look at what that looks like. We wanted to see the number of rows. What were the colors? Is there a background color? What type of a shape is it? And then a little bit of a narrative about what we're actually seeing. And as it turned out, there was like, I think a dozen different sign classifications for this state. So we had a dozen different um, prompts because we had a, do a dozen different things that we were evaluating. Like, for example, some signs, we care about the text that's on this text that's on the sign because it might say, you know, duck crossing or something like that. And in some cases, we don't care if it's an exit sign. We're, we don't care about what the exits are, right? We just care that it's an exit sign. So we send it to the to the vision model. With these instructions, we get back this information, then we vectorize this information. We do the same for the training. This is what the training information looked like. And we get the exact same descriptions, very similar to that ontology mapping that I was talking about earlier. Get the same information back, and then we vectorize the, the, the source training information. And then uh, um, <clears throat> we will vectorize the images and then determine whether or not those match. And as you can see here on the top, it's a 0.78 match. We did the same thing with some testing. We actually compared it against, we already had the human tagger information, so it was easy for us to establish a threshold. And ultimately, using both the vision model and vector matching to be able to determine when we had a match with the signs. Really 
uh, proud of uh, that particular use case. Oh, how sad. Um, so in that case, that was an example of of um, uh, using a couple of different models in conjunction with each other to do some of this mapping. So that is the uh, at least the conclusion of my presentation part of this, this, this discussion. I look forward to entertaining um, some questions and, and thoughts and discussions that, that you all might have. And uh, even if, if we have a little bit more time, I'm happy to uh, talk a little bit about the Claristotle thing, too, that a lot of you here are familiar with. But just in case we want to dig into that, that actually does have a little bit of vector and some retrieval um, uh, meaning to it. So exhale. What do we think about different ways we can use vectors and embeddings? Spark any uh, ideas. Um that hey Chris, that last thing that you did uh, was very cool. Um, just curious, interesting. What what um, you you had uh, or the company had cars driving around with like checking for the existence of signs to make sure they're still up or yeah, it's um it's make sure there's really the number one question <laughs> that the Department of Transportation's want is where where do we deploy our resources for fixing road signs and <clears throat> their alternative is just to send a bunch of humans out there driving around looking for signs but this way they're actually capturing uh the state of them there's different levels of condition and so at the end of it we can take all this data and plot on a map uh where the ones that need the most um you know maintenance are so they can d deploy their teams accordingly and I answer all sorts of other sort of like maintenance related questions and i actually whether or not they have um uh, road work planned in the future and what impact it might have on signs or if they're going to add an exit or all this kind of, there's really kind of fascinating amounts of intel that these DOTs needed out of this information. Now, okay. they're still using that same vehicle to gather all the same information? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So there's yeah, they, still they're, using that. Their their IP is is the the vehicle and the lidar capturing uh, mechanism. They, I don't think that it's protected or anything, uh, but that's really what their value is. And just sending them out on the roads and capturing every every bit of the road there. Your 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 side of it was just to make sure that uh, people the image have to go through all those images. <laughs> Man. Yeah, I mean they literally have like I, I forget how many it was. It was at least a hundred people that just sit there all day and they just scroll to the next thing. What does that sign look like? And they're, they're like meant like visually or mentally doing the matching. So you can imagine like what types of errors you might run into just from attrition and, and, you know, sort of human limitations. So we're able to allow them an alternative at scale. Um, and like the ROI on that is bonkers. I mean, they were literally, they're literally like, was their number one after their HR costs, their number one cost was uh, what they were paying their vendor uh, to be able to do all that tagging for them. Hey, Chris, um, would it be within the realm of possibility that uh, the Tesla cars that are driving all over California might possibly be uh, capturing uh, image information and sending it back to the mothership? Yeah, that's funny because that actually, I, I did a presentation at an EV summit uh, with these guys because they're very involved in um, EV as well, too, as, as it turns out. And that was one of the topics. One of the topics was it, literally this organization had worked with Tesla to say, well, look, how much of these roads are you actually capturing and can you do this for us? And that's an absolute, well, actually, for some reason, they were talking to Apple, too, I guess when Apple was doing the or no, when Apple was doing mapping is what it was. And they were like, hey, as long as you're going out there, can you can you uh, capture these? It just didn't get 100% of it. So there's probably a good hybrid. I'm sure they were exploring this to determine um, what the hybrid approach is. How much of, how, where would we actually have to deploy cars where we're not actually just getting this data anyway? So um, it's very smart uh, um, um, observation there because that's literally what they were, the kind of things they were looking at. Well, at the very least, I'm hoping that provided a little bit of inspiration as to some of the amazing things we can do with matching. And, you know, this is a whole sector of of, of uh, using language models that has nothing to do with answering questions and what kind of truth is in the model. Um, for those of you that have heard me talk about this before, those that will hear me talk about it in the future, I'm kind of a jerk about the idea of when people think that the value of language models is that they need to be accurate when they answer our questions. 
it just so happens they can actually do that with some degree of accuracy, but that is a byproduct of the training process. That's not really an intended use case. Instead, what we can do is use them, uh, you know, to train them to do things like embeddings and then actually leverage them to do extraction techniques like I showed you here. And none of the things I was showing you here was I relying on a language model to have a correct answer. So when I hear people talk about, you know, hallucinations or I'm not using language models because they're wrong or whatever, I just roll my eyes and I go, well, you'll figure it out in a couple of years that that's not actually what the superpowers of these models is. So it was really fun for me to be able to just ignore all of that and just go with just this one simple, well, various different uh, ways that we can leverage the models, not the, not the least of which, of course, was the focus on the embedding model versions of language models. So at the very least, I hope that helps you guys understand that, you know, these models are not question answer machines. That's not what the, the purpose of these for business are. It's on our phones and on our desks and we want to ask questions. I find it to be a lot more efficient than Google because Google has a lot of lies and mistruths and hallucinations in them too. And also has all that static with um, with ads. And I don't even know if I consider ads to be true, frankly, but um, um, I, I think that's, an, I just want to just kind of get you guys out of the space of like, what's the real value of, of language models? And it's not as question answer machines. And these are examples of some of the things you can do there. I don't know how you guys feel about that comment, but. Yeah, we have some questions in the chat. Uh, York, do you want to speak uh, more about what you're asking or? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, York. Yeah, I, I, I just wonder that uh, uh, for the case that, uh, Chris mentioned that uh, it seems uh, quite a big case, particularly the uh, uh, traffic sign. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of a case is good for Clarice FileMaker to handle or Clarice FileMaker AI is good for certain kind of a case. So uh, if, if uh, Chris can share this uh, with, with me, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so... What I will tell you is that the translation, the human in the loop, the matching, and actually everything I showed are all actual, these are all applications that are deployed in FileMaker. So this, it just happened to be, I didn't do this on purpose, but all of these actually happen to be where we're using um, uh the language models and embeddings in conjunction with FileMaker. Now, I will be very honest and say that pretty much every one of these, except for this one, we did and delivered before FileMaker had uh, support for AI. So by the time the FileMaker native AI came around, like we were already using insert from URL to do our API calls. We're all using, using, you know, parsing JSON and, and we were using different vector databases instead of storing the vectors directly in FileMaker. But this one came around when all those tools were available. And so we were able to actually leverage FileMaker's native AI capabilities, like, uh, embedding text, storing embeddings, uh, performing searches and determining the distance, the cosine distance between two vectors, um, and uh, and and to be able to do that natively within FileMaker. So, um, I wouldn't like. I would say, well, there's two interesting things there. First, you can see you didn't actually need all the new um, features that were introduced in FileMaker 21 to be able to integrate AI into your FileMaker applications. That's the first takeaway, and the second one is. Um, yeah, just like other things, there's limitations when it comes to FileMaker, like depending on how many dimensions you're dealing with or, um, you know, what, what kind of uh, data you're storing, you could easily bloat the heck out of your FileMaker databases, whereas some other platforms might not be as, um, you know, impacted by the size of the files or the increase of the files. Uh, but, you know, they're just, just like in FileMaker, if somebody tells you that, you've got, you know, millions of rows and you want to create an index on every single field, you know, every, every single one of your 2000 fields, you would probably say, uh Oh, that might not be the best job for FileMaker. It's the same kind of considerations here. Um, but I, hopefully, hopefully it's meaningful and inspirational that all of these are actually FileMaker applications. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, uh, it, it's a little more pedantic than uh, the kind of examples you're sh showing today, but uh, one common thing we have is is um, an issue with a lot of clients is a huge, messy context databases that, uh, and we're importing new context into the databases, and we'd love to be able to clean up the data that's in, you know, the, 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 with fuzzy something like fuzzy matching. Yeah, uh, is is that sort of method? Yeah, I think it, I think. Yeah, um, 
the John Jonathan match um, is actually uh, is a is a a great use case for um, semantic matching. Uh, you know, um, you can pretty use pretty much use like an ADA or like a standard like sort of mid dimension size. Um, but I I would absolutely encourage doing some experimentation with like you know duplicate checking. Um, uh, Matt. Uh, Navarre, who I do a podcast with, by the way, if you guys haven't stumbled across the Claris Talk AI podcast, please go check it out. We've got about 10 episodes, various different guests and all sorts of really important topics, not the least of which was the Vector episode. But he actually had a really interesting thing we were showing on one of the episodes where he was like combining a various different fields together and creating like a JSON object and then vectorizing the JSON object. And for his purposes, he was doing some other kind of work. But in that case, I could see um, doing those same steps to be able to determine whether or not you've got a duplicate of that information in your system. Um, so and it was one of the first things I thought of, too. Is, so you and I are thinking the same along the same lines is like, can I solve the John Jonathan, um, you know, thing and the language models have a lot of intelligence in there where, you know, they, um, you know, might know that bill is short for William or something like, like there, it has tons of language in it. So, um, beyond even the vectors of uh, language models outside of vector match, you might actually be able to solve some of those problems. So I strongly encourage you to do some experiments with that kid if you're not already doing so. Right. Right. And I mean, this goes beyond the, the John Johnson and bill Robert, it goes, you know, it goes into typos. It goes into oh. uh, abbreviations for street addresses and oh, towns. it's, uh, it's perfect for that. As a matter of fact, um, Language models do not care about spelling at all. And I could not be happier about that. Not because I'm a bad speller. Mm -hmm. I'm just a terrible typist. Um, and and hello, Alexi. Alexi probably knows this because I sent her a lot of emails for a long time uh, when we were working together. So uh, people kind of get to know when they're working with me that I can't type very well. And then all of a sudden language models came along and they don't care that I can't type. If I say street instead of ST or drive instead of drive, they don't care. They can figure it all out. As a matter of fact, they kind of have superpowers in that area because they're completion algorithms. So they're actually particularly good at filling in the blanks and guessing what should be here, what comes next. So the type of stuff that you're talking about are actually really good um, applications for not even I would actually do. I would actually see if language models with a proper prompting can actually figure out matches or um, duplicates or whatever it is that you're trying to do, even before I go with vectorization. I think both of them would would serve you well. There, but. I thought I read something when when the Claris AI first came out uh, that it specifically didn't handle uh, that type of thing. I don't I don't know what what text. Yeah, I can't. I'm not exactly sure how it map Claris's specific functionality to it. Just but finding the right model. For yeah, that. yeah. I would just yeah. It's all it's really about the right model. And maybe it was because they just have support for. I don't know. I think OpenAI would do a pretty good job of that actually. But um, okay. I have confidence that. Uh, that those are experiments worth pursuing. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Beverly, for posting the podcast there. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, bring up uh, Clara's style because... Let's do it. Okay. That so, might answer some questions as well. Yeah, so let me... Um, Okay, so first of all, if if any, just in case, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that I don't, you know, run out of time on this, but... Um, uh, oh, let me actually get this out of the way real quick. Okay, so um, we have a um, actually Beverly. Sorry, I don't have it handy. Do you happen to in in maybe your emails or something? If you could find the the uh, invite to the Discord channel. Yeah, I'll and get it. Thanks, appreciate that. And so, uh, and it's in the it's probably in a lot of the show notes on the those YouTube uh, uh, episodes of the podcast as well too. But um, this is a conversation we've been having. With where we've you know the 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 end of the the story is that we there's this problem that it recognized and 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 I wanted this to be a com community effort. I'll explain why I think this is an important community effort here in, as a second in a second. But we're really looking for people that want to participate, and I'll show there's different ways to participate. This is essentially the purpose of the, what Claristotle is is to create an open source knowledge base of FileMaker expertise, and to lend that through mostly retrieval and maybe someday fine tuning, but probably just retrieval is gonna be adequate enough as a knowledge base that everyone in the world and the FileMaker community can use. Um, that's the short answer. So um, while it's not currently an application, the idea is we would have this open source knowledge base that people could build their own applications and, uh, <clears throat> and link to. 
So why would we do this in the first place? Well, there's a very important problem that would be solved with an effort like this. And, um, and it really has to do with learning. So I'll just tell you that when I first, uh, when I did that, uh, um, you know, go go be an insane person for 10 days out in the in the middle of the wilderness with just myself my dog and a in a in just a tiny little bit of internet that I could actually do API calls to the open AI model back in um uh December of 2020 all I was looking at is this as a training tool as a matter of fact I thought the first problem I wanted to solve with this tool was that like JavaScript was really just being introduced into our community at the time and it was clear to me as an educator um if I put on my trainer hat that like nobody knew JavaScript right and so I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if I could go to DevCon 2021, which I ultimately I don't think happened, um, and I could go, hey, everybody, guess what? Just say which JavaScript you want, and it'll create it. Now, that actually sounds a lot more doable now than that seemed at the time, but um, I pursued it as a learning tool. How can I actually use models like this to be able to train people and teach them that? Well, and... Um, the first quarter of 2021, Copilot, the model Copilot actually came out. So I said, well, forget it. People will just use that for JavaScript. Why don't I turn my attention to how can people use this to learn FileMaker? Because again, I'm a FileMaker educator. I work with beginners all the time. And and I actually, between then and now, I actually worked with a lot of um, uh, career development programs like with uh, um, uh, Quasar and 42U School. So I was teaching, you know, kids, knowledgeable technology people, how to use FileMaker. But when I, and then I was experimenting with using uh, language models to be able to help them accelerate in the process. And, and for those that showed up early, I was telling you about how I just did this in a live class back in June. It worked out really well. Here's the problem though. I rabbit hold on, so I, I rabbit hold on this idea and ultimately found out that the answers that we get back, and I, I did this back in GPT-3, so I would imagine they're, they are better now, but GPT-3, the, the answers were just not consistently uh, adequate enough to be able to really have somebody just rely on them as a source of truth. So that's the problem I discovered. And I want to just share with you just from a pure learning standpoint, um, I got, I really um, became a, a trainer uh, that, that people had heard of because of this woman here, Linda Weinman. Um, she used to, she's uh, Linda of lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com. Uh, she's now a multi-billionaire that has like a house on the same street as Oprah. And like, I, she wouldn't take my calls anymore. But back in the old days, um, I actually took a flash class of hers. Uh, you know, all the kids are laughing at me, but I actually went up to Ojai, sat in a, um, sat in a class with this woman and she taught me flash taught me and my little sister flash and i used to get to, i got to know her and then she let me start doing classes with her and and she would do this thing where she would take all the authors out and tell us her philosophies on on learning and the reason she's a multi-billionaire is because she essentially revolutionized training by um i mean videos i know this sounds weird but that was like a a revolutionary idea for learning and her philosophy was something that's called guide on the side this was not unique to linda but um, I was really inspired by it. So she says that there's really two kinds of learning. There's guide on the side and then sage on the stage. Sage on the stage is what I'm doing right now. I'm just sitting here lecturing at you and I'm just spewing my information and you're not having any interacti interactivity with it. And maybe everybody who's listening to me has a different learning level. As a matter of fact, all other educators that are on this call with me know one of the hardest things to do when you're putting a classroom together is find people that are even within the same uh, level of understanding of, of the topic so that everybody gets the same meaning from it. So she believed that an effective teaching involved guiding students and discovering to learn independently rather than just delivering information. As a matter of fact, there was a gentleman named Benjamin Bloom back in the 80s, 1984, that had this concept that's called the Two Sigma Problem. And, and for those of you that are, that are fascinated with this topic, you should check it out. But essentially what he said is kind of like a, yeah, no shit Sherlock type thing here, but he said one-on-one -on -one tutoring combined with uh, mastery leads to a two standard deviation improvement in student performance. So that means that you can move from the 50th percentile to the 96th percentile of effective learning by just simply having a tutor. Okay, of course, Chris, if we all had somebody sitting next to us, an actual guide on the side, we could do that. Well, the reason that Benjamin Bloom called this a two sigma problem back in 1984 is what he was really trying to show with this study was that it's impossible for us to do that. We've got millions and millions of kids that are learning at any given time at all different levels of learning all the way up into secondary education. And there's no way we can have somebody sit right next to him and truly be a guide on the side until AI came about. Now, 
Um, one, if you guys are familiar with um, Khan Academy, uh, they were one of the first people to get first organizations to get. Um, as a matter of fact, um, the the um, um, what is his first name? I forget. Uh, the the founder um, is like a, a luminary in the AI space now. He's sort of like known as like the the main like the tip of the spear in AI education, and he came up with this concept of um, a Khan Amigo. It seems a little novel now, but this was back in when GPT-4 first came out. He got like uh, six months early, um, early access to it. And so what he discovered is he could actually create um, this interactive like tutorial experience rather than just a question answer machine. You could actually tell it about the student, tell this, what the student's lesson plans are, IEPs, and tell them where they are on their learning journey. Teach them about the student, what they like, like maybe the student's into skateboarding. And so the model will know to actually use skateboarding terms and concepts or video games or something to help them learn these different things. And so um, through prompt engineering, he's able to actually come up with ways that um, it can guide them through it or they can quiz them and it can not give them the answer and it can step them through these things. And um, this was kind of revolutionary from not only being a tutor, but probably the closest thing to a human tutor sitting right next to students that are learning something um, and, and, and give them this like true uh, value of education. As a matter of fact, if you guys haven't seen this hasn't actually come out yet, but if you haven't seen this demonstration, let me show you now what the evolution of this is. Uh, please to enjoy this video and hopefully you guys can hear it. I'm here with my son and I love you to tutor him on this math problem but don't give him the answer. You can ask questions and nudge him in the right direction, but I really wanna make sure he understands it himself. And he's here in the room, so you can talk to him directly. Of course, I'd be happy to help. Let's look at the problem together. Can you first identify which sides of the triangle are the opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse relative to angle alpha? All right, so I'm pretty sure this is the angle alpha right here, right? Fact. That's correct. Well, now, that looking at the triangle, weird. which side do you think is the hypotenuse? Um, Remember really, I'm, the hypotenuse? I'm not totally sure. I think, I think it might be this one, but I really am not sure. This side AC? You're close. Actually, side AC is called the adjacent side to the angle alpha. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically what I'm showing you there is that the future of learning is really here. Now, I'm going to get to the problem of the accuracy of the source information, but um, but the point is, this is how people should be learning. That thing I just showed you is, is um, GPT-4's new advanced voice model, which is only rolled out to like a very small group of people. As soon as, as, soon as I get my hands on it, I'll be posting a bunch of videos and such. But, but that actually can see your entire screen and have a, a, a more dynamic conversation with the learner. So this ultimately is like the perfect case. Like imagine you had this thing on your screen and you're a learner, a FileMaker, and you can talk to it and it can see your screen and it can review your FileMaker scripts because it actually has screen broadcast capabilities. And imagine when we have that level of um, learning experience. Uh, to me, this is a would profoundly impact not only our community, but the usage of the platform and just really be something that could impact, um, you know, uh, FileMaker usability and learnability, like in, by orders of magnitude. Oh, and by the way, you can use other voices too. Um, what was I doing here? So this was, okay. Yeah, so this was one of my early, this is one of my early tests. This is me in this very same booth. And I, this was where I was, I had the uh, chat bot. And I was doing a bunch of demo, demos for the people at Claris to say, hey, I think this should be how this should be built into the platform. You should be, people should be able to ask questions. And uh, I even used a little bit of voice. I think this was back in um, 2022, if I'm not mistaken. So let's see what I was doing. It's kind of silly. One possible use case for the on layout enter script trigger is to perform a find when a layout is first entered in order to display only relevant data. Okay, well, if you, by the way, I have a much better voice uh, model now than I did back a couple of years back, but I was even saying, well, heck, you could even have Chris, the, uh, the guide on the side, if you care to hear my voice actually saying these answers if you'd like to. So we can do things like incorporate voice input and do voice output, but the problem for this to be effective is that these models have a gap in latent intelligence. And so how do we fix that? So certainly the jump from three to 3.5 and the jump from 3.5 to four and from four to four oh, and then the soon to be jump from four oh to five will improve upon that because 
this is what's really interesting about um, the FileMaker opportunity here. There are not a lot of software applications that have 30 years worth of discussion of the software in the training corpus of these, of these models. FileMaker arguably could be maybe one of the few that actually has that much data in the inherent training set. So that means that even though the latent intelligence isn't perfect, it's going to be a lot higher than a lot of a lot of other software um, support information that might be in the training data. The other thing is we talked about human in the for loop reinforcement and um, uh, the training sets are only publicly available data. So like none of the data that I had on like lynda.com or LinkedIn learning is part of this training set because it was behind a, a paywall. So I could contribute that data. And if I contribute that data to the latent knowledge base that of the model training intelligence, I could then level up how accurate intelligence these are. Plus those 50,000 worldwide developers could also become human in the loop reinforcement uh, uh, training uh, 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 trainers or contributors. So here's something interesting to really kind of level what the, the latent intelligence of the models are. I, I actually will push back on when people say, yeah, I use it for five minutes and it's all garbage. Well, I, I actually took a more scientific approach. This isn't the scientific approach, but this was a fun anecdote. On our podcast, um, Navar has this like um, this this certification exam that he gives his students to take his class. And most of them are like similar to similar uh, certification exams. Um you know, that we all take, but he come, you know, kind of writes the questions himself. And so he sent it to me once and he's like, Hey, Chris, I'd love, I'd love for you to check out my test. I want you to take the test for me. So I didn't tell him, but, um, I, I had chat GPT for turbo, not the one we have right now, but for turbo was what we had at the time. And I had it take the test. And I literally, what I did is I took screenshots of the question and, and the answers that he provided. And I just fed it into one big long thread in GPT four O in literally in chat GPT. And I took the answers and I put it into his database. And then I showed up for the podcast with him and I said, how did I do? And he goes, Oh, it wasn't bad. You got a 78, you know, like even my really good students, they get like 81 or something like that. So yours wasn't bad, but I expected more of you. I go, well, that was chat GPT taking the exam. So that's a certification exam. Now keep in mind, I took an even more scientific approach. This was way back in GPT 3.5. What I did, and this is actually how you really do it, you don't do certification exams. What you do is you create a, 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 a pairing of prompts and completions. This is actually how you fine tune a model. And this is also how you can semantically score a model. So what I did is I took 200, this is just showing 30 of them, but I went into the scripts references and the calculation references in the FileMaker help system. And if you scroll down, you get to the little part where they have the sample code and right above it is a description of the code. So what I did was I, took the description of the code and instead said, I would rephrase it to say something like create a FileMaker calculation that, and then I would input what the help system description was. And then I would say the, this is the correct answer as determined by the FileMaker help system. I did that for 200 of these and I semantically scored the answer that ChatGPT gave back, the GPT 3.5. This is the API model. I'm sorry. I'm, I usually kind of poke fun at people that, Call, it's called the, the API models ChatGPT, but I just did it like three times. In this case, I actually was doing API calls. So I was doing an API call to the 2022 version of GPT 3.5. Bottom line was it had a latent um, intelligence of 64% accuracy on script and and um, and calculations. This is without us giving it any additional information or using like a retrieval technique. So 64% from a scientific scoring and a 70 percent from just a kind of silly fun scoring, which means that that's very promising. It's not accurate, but it's a very promising base level of intelligence for us to be able to improve upon. So there's a couple of ways that we could actually uh, yeah, and by the way, thank you, Beverly. If you go into, um, if you please join the Discord channel, if you go into the gist, you'll see recording of this presentation and a bunch of other um, um, embellishing uh, documents is there as well too. So there's really um, two ways we can make the, mo the, the models smarter. We could do something that's called fine tuning and without getting into the weeds on this, I can tell you that fine tuning, we would need, we would like there's, the, the problem is fine tuning a model is like sort of like doing a ground troops war against a model for as much uh, data, the troops that it has in the war, you have to have more troops. So if you think about 30 years worth of data that's in these models, and by the way, why is it wrong? Well, it's not because these language models are dumb. I hate to say it, but it's kind of our fault because it has much 
Think about all the different in t discussions in forums, for example. A forum starts off with, hey, here's my script. Something's wrong with it. Um, can you guys help me? And then there's a bunch of people guessing. Sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's wrong. And then finally, maybe there's the correct answer. That is, There's just as much of that wrong FileMaker stuff in the training set as there is right FileMaker stuff. So we would have to actually get verified right stuff and outweigh, like beat down in our little ground troops battle, all the data that's in there. And that's 30 years worth of data. And that's just like too much data. So the real way to do it is through retrieval augmented generation or RAG. That means we would create a knowledge base of all sorts of truth about FileMaker. And then we would vectorize all of it and we would make that open source and publicly available to people that want to then do vector searches against that data on little chunks and bring those chunks back into their education systems or their coding uh, assistant systems and make this available to all people all around the world. So this is kind of what, this is what the rag steps look like. What the little circle in there is what we're talking about. That's what Claristotle is. Claristotle could have derivative chatbots and, and applications and plugins and add-ons and all sorts of stuff that the community could create on their own. But what the task is, is to create the knowledge base first and, and park it somewhere that everybody would have open source uh, access to. And I also think it's a kind of a profound and like, as an educator, like having the whole world come together and share their knowledge and put it all in one spot it's kind of like a just an amazing sort of like philosophical thing that I think would be really interesting. And I don't think there's many communities besides ours that could pull that off. So the other thing that's cool about it is this is a snippet of one of our um, AI chatbot deployments where we actually do a thumbs down thing. So even the way that we can validate truth is we can actually allow... Um, experts, and there's different various different methods for uh, um, getting experts to interact with it. By the way, this whole thumbs down thing in like ChatGPT or Claude or all these different uh, um, applications that do this is just you providing free uh, human reinforcement learning to OpenAI or Anthropic. Just you, that's why these tools are free uh, in a lot of cases. So here we could actually have validated experts be able to go in and say, no, this answer was incorrect, or I would have said the answer should be this. So what we can do with that is since we're using the retrieval technique, that means that that chunk of information that that expert deemed wrong actually lives in a row in a vector database. We can go find that original row and then update it with a validated experts update. So these are the types of things we can do to continuously learn and make these better. There's also different tools that you can use for this where we can, the bird watch method is like a community notes type thing where you can, um, you know, there's a certain way that you can determine what type of individuals were more engaged, uh, could actually, you know, upvote truth, for example. There's all sorts of different ways we could do this. Um, and then also because it's retrieval, we can actually do citation. So you can turn on citation if you want, or we can make it required or whatever. So if you're in a chat bot, it might pop up and say, oh, this answer to the question that this learner was, was asking about came from a paper that Beverly wrote. And you can link right to that paper if you want to, because uh, part of the metadata when you're capturing this information is citation as well too. Um, and then also, um, you know, that, that's actually kind of a standard approach. Citation is a standard approach inside um, the uh, a lot of the chatbots. So this is what we've got so far. Whoops. So I've been talking with, uh, you know, mostly Ronnie through Claris and, and Rick, and, and they're very into this idea. And so um, if you guys go on uh, the Discord and you go under the GIST uh, channel, you're going to see the last conversation that Ronnie and I had about what we're doing, what we're doing next. And it, it really involves uh, starting with the Claris help system and going through a very specific type of classification where we talk about like topic notes, code examples, is this code? Um, and there was another thing that he had come up with too. I, I, forgive me, all, all that information's in there. But, but right now where we're at with this is I've donated, I have vectorized, it took me forever, but I vectorized everything I've ever said about FileMaker. Uh, it just so happens that I'm very obsessive about scripts. So every time I do something, I have a script. I even have a script right here. Believe it or not, I actually had a script for this big, long ramble. So every time I'm doing something, whether it's a video I've done on LinkedIn or Linda.com or de uh, my 50 DevCon sessions or any of the YouTube stuff that I've done or podcast episodes or user groups like this, I took the transcript and I have 
thousands and thousands of documents of scripts from my videos. And so I vectorized all those and I put those all into one vector store and it's 2.5 million tokens worth of data which I couldn't even normalize until the the Google Gemini uh, one, 1 million token model and now the 2 million token model came out. So I was able to do some redundancy elimination with that. But I'm donating, I'm saying, I'm out of the, I'm keeping all my knowledge to myself and people have to pay me for it business. I'm donating all 2.5 million tokens of everything I've ever said about FileMaker as a trainer. And Claris is gonna uh, start off by donating help. They're eventually gonna donate knowledge base. DevCon sessions, webinars, and customer stories, and all sorts of other stuff as well. But we're starting very small with help. And ultimately, what we're going to do is figure out how to classify knowledge so that anybody who donates knowledge, like oh, we'll start with my stuff, we can classify it in the same manner as the Claris help. And then these will go into this like community data source somewhere. It'll likely be like on a GitHub repo um, or um, even Kaggle or something like that. It doesn't necessarily need to be a hosted, like centralized vector database or anything. The the data itself can be can be shared. And then we can put it into an environment where people can upvote and downvote information. And we can invite specialized experts to come and validate it and provide their own uh, influence on the truth of this data. And um, we can then measure as we keep adding more knowledge to see well, by the way, one of the things that Ronnie and I discussed doing was redoing the the test where I did the 63% baseline. That was like almost three versions of GPT ago. So we want to we're gonna take um the help system and instead of having 200, we'll probably have like a thousand or hundreds at least um of prompts and completions. And we're gonna figure out what the baseline is. We'll make it public to everybody. It will be more than 64%. I'm predicting probably somewhere in the low 70s, maybe mid 70s. And then that will be our baseline. And then when we introduce, then we will score it with, when it has uh, the retrieval um, uh, uh, data source available to it with just help. And we'll see if it goes from like a 72 to a 75. And then we'll add like some of my stuff in and some of your stuff and everything. And we'll just see how it keeps going and going and going. And we'll have this public like, like, like barometer that says, this is how much latent knowledge about FileMaker. This is how accurate this, this knowledge base plus the current model is. And then when GPT-5 comes out, we can test our knowledge base against that and see how we level up. So that way we don't have to guess how accurate these things are. We will know this will be shared knowledge amongst our whole community. Our community will actually influence the truth and accuracy of all this information. And someday soon we'll all have access to this. I don't know how quickly we can get this together, but Ronnie and I have sort of been saying, and we've talked for those, you know, a bunch of you guys have been in the meetings as well too, about, you know, maybe trying to have this together for like DevCon or something and maybe do like a session or a discussion about this with people. So um, so it's all about retrieval. It's all about vectorizing knowledge. And it's all about community source knowledge and open sourcing it for the community for the purpose of actually leveling up the best models about, you can pick whatever model you want. Um, that's the beauty about uh, retrieval is we're not fine tuning an open source model, for example, and then we have to go fine tune another model that comes out. Like, let's say we fine tune Llama 3 and then all of a sudden Llama 3.1 comes out. We got to do the whole process all over again. Instead, you just switch the model. There'll be, you know, you'll deal with the prompting um, uh, formatting on, on your side, but the knowledge itself will be available to these models. And when we get to like GPT-6 and the community has contributed so much knowledge, we're going to be in the high 80s, low 90s, maybe mid 90s of accuracy. And this is going to become a... a profound learning tool for new learners and beginner learners and even evaluators of the platform to be able to, to learn this. And maybe even FileMaker ends up building, uh, using this source themselves to be able to build coding assistance actually into the application, which we do not have at all right now. So anyways, that's the Claristotle concept. If you'd like to get involved, um, please go to the Discord um, and if you're interested in, if you've got training materials or YouTube links, please go on there, um, and, um, check out, um, you know, the conversations we'll post when the next, when the next discussions are happening. So you guys can all join in. We're going to wait till Ronnie gets all the knowledge classified and we'll take it from there. But, um, I hope to see you guys as part of the conversation. And, um, I'm really, I really think it's really fun, interesting, fascinating, and important thing that we can all be a part of together and leave a bit of legacy of our knowledge. So, um, so thanks, uh, you guys, for listening to me talk for two hours. Wow, that's amazing. Um, but uh, this is fun for me. I really appreciate it. These are some topics that I'm really excited about. And, um, 
you guys know where to find me. If you ever need anything, you can um, hit me up on LinkedIn, uh, reach out to me directly. Uh, please watch the, the, uh, the, um, the podcast as well, too. We'll have all sorts of new information. So thank you, everybody. I uh, really appreciate your time today and um, hope you all have a very good night and feel inspired after today's discussion. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Eric. Uh, don't worry about the time so much. Uh, you haven't broken cool. any record yet. Okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> the um, um, yeah, question about the, some of the Claire stuff. So, so with Please. the transcripts, did you have to do it? Have to do anything about cleaning up the transcripts, spell checks, or anything like that? Oh, or yeah. you just fed it to it and it just figured everything out. Well, my biggest thing was um, re redundancy elimination because, like, if you think about it, like I had the script from FileMaker Essential Training. 17 and FileMaker Central Training 18. Like they weren't, you know, I didn't take the time to go through all these things and, and take them all out. So I had to do a lot of elimination of redundant information in there. Um, but spelling doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. The language models okay. will complete for that and forgive for that. Okay. Um, so none of that I matters. Just, and yeah, I know it's looking through some of the transcripts, um, you know, especially with Tech Talk and all the, you know, we, we'll be mentioning all these different websites and, and, you know, it'll, for the longest time, it would, turn FileMaker into filmmaker and <laughs> things like that and, yep. so you, and so but you you say it's able to figure figure out what we're talking about even if the transcripts look like that well yeah and we also like if i spend some more time i actually did a, lo a lot of this i didn't actually do the FileMaker filmmaker thing but um i went in and i actually said now give me this whole data set back where you've removed all, uh, what was I doing? I was doing uh, speaker notes because I have like these very sp specific type of format that I use to talk to myself while I'm reading the script. And I had it eliminate all those, for example. And then there was like a specific type of format of a header that was in a lot of these documents and I had it eliminate those things. So I really mm -hmm. use language models to just keep iterating on these and, and getting rid of URLs and making sure it spells FileMaker correctly is really <laughs> one, it, you know, one of the good tasks we could perform with this stuff. And then one other thing I was thinking about is because um, you you're going to have to have humans kind of approve what it's coming up with, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. And that's where we have 50,000 testers worldwide that can actually be the humans in the loop to do that uh, upvoting or downvoting of this yeah. information. So I was kind of wondering, because, you know, we have a, a lot of resources kind of invested in, commu you know, the community and other sites where, where people can ask questions and get answers from other. I was wondering if it could actually automatically become a participant in the community where you like... Like it would just sit there and watch the community just like the rest of us and try to answer people's questions. Well, we one of the when I was experimenting with the Claris uh, learning companion is what I called it. I was mm -hmm. actually working. I might as well just say this now. But in um, 2022, when I showed you that little video with the voice thing, I was actually working a lot with Rick Kalman and he and I would do these weekly sessions where we would try to further this and see, you know, um, uh you know, what, what, what we could, what, what kind of information we could get out of this and what kind of learning we could get from it. And so what we, one of the things that we, um, that we experimented with, this is kind of fun is we took the learning companion and we had it like Rick just sat and answered a bunch of questions on Claire's community for like a day. And, 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 he shared all these threads with me and everything. We have them captured somewhere. I, I, if Rick watches this or whatever, I, I, we, we should blow the dust off of those things. But he actually sneaky was answering Claire's community questions. And the engagement was amazing. People were like, oh, my God, thank you so much. We appreciate it. You know, we were checking to make sure the answers are correct. But yeah. we tested to see if we could actually have it do that. And so the answer is, yeah, it absolutely could. The other thing where the community things come in uh, and someone had recommended, I thought this was a great idea. You could actually have like a, a tool in the community sites that when you determine what the correct answer is, it can automatically grab the original question and the answer and then send it over to the knowledge base automatically as a pair, right? So kind of speaking similar to what you're talking about there. Yeah. So yeah, I thought, I mean, an interesting concept, if you could actually make it a member of the community and it just yeah. tries to answer everything, right? Yeah. I mean, we, it'd be so slightly it, annoying, but I mean, if it could try to answer everything and then people could go back and give feedback of, of whether or not that was a good And answer. I think the best metaphor is like AI is a perfect um, tier one support. As long as you have an escalation path to a tier two or maybe into tier three, and people know that this is the first line of support, um, I think it could do really kind of impressive things. So um, to uh, Tony. Uh, hey, Chris, thank you. 
The um, Claristotle, uh, very, very interesting. And um, it, it looks like you got a good plan, uh, in my opinion, um, starting with the help sounds spot on to me. Um, a couple, three, three things that might be good. Um, one, I'd be kind of curious how the improvement in the help docs, they're, they're you know, they're good. Uh, we all know nothing is perfect, right? So what, what was, what's the process of, uh, what did you say, a validated expert uh, or maybe a mere mortal who's well, precocious? Sure. Well, suggesting things. That, yeah. Keep in mind that we're, we're, the reason we're starting with help is because it has built in expert truth validation because we're assuming Claire, I mean, I'm with you. They're not perfect, but we're assuming Claris is validating the truth of their health help documentation. Right. So, so out, when we get to the other stuff, that's not coming from Claris, then we're going to need to have expert reinforcement in there. And then that point we would have to prop this knowledge up, let people interact with it and do and upvote or downvote answers or maybe uh, recommend um, uh, suggestions in that case. So that's so, probably so, down the line. So, Chris, let's say that I'm looking at a help and there's examples and there's three examples and I and I have like a fourth example that's good mm -hmm. and I want to submit it. And I'm philosophically, I'm inclined to submit it publicly. I don't mind if people, you know, rip it apart and say it's horrible, but I, I don't want to black hole it. Uh, and obviously you're doing an initiative. So, you know, that's proactive. Um, I, and another, you know, and maybe if, if, if the help requests were like a get, you know, where you're submitting a pull request, I believe it's called. Yes. And, you know, I might yeah. say, for instance, hey, this this function is linked to the script step. So there's the cross reference because and this gets into the second of my three points. I think the power in FileMaker uh, comes from using features in combination. Totally agree. Right. So if I have a script step, it's pretty useless without, a, you know, another script step or another function or and so forth and so on. Um, well, and that, by the way, is why a database of called Claristotle would not be useful, because what we actually need is the synthesis of taking all these different pieces. Together. And that's actually how it's answering questions, just so we all know. Like when you ask, even in the 68 percent accuracy or whatever we have, when you ask a question of it, it's not going and finding where someone answered that exact question. It's it's synthesizing. It basically taught itself through these little snippets. Like I learned this script step and I learned this script step. And then I figured out what relationship they have to each other. So it's doing some of that. Like it's super important that it does that. It's doing some of that already. And it will continue to do that with the knowledge that we provide to it. So, all right. And um, I looked at a, I, I look at the help requests or what are they called? The community uh, posts. And, you know, I, I'm not ever going to try and answer every single one. But one of the ones today was what I would classify as an FAQ, uh, mm -hmm. bread and butter. Uh, hey, I want to export a PDF with a name and, you know, do something with it. That's bread and butter, right? Yep. Um, and, this, and, and, you know, I'm, I don't want to go too on here, but, uh, and I'll join the, the Discord thing. Okay. Uh, but that's my final point is that the functions, the script steps, the script triggers, the objects of the various types and so forth, and then how to use them in combination to address the frequent use cases that make the platform shine. Yep. You know, where like every system that you bump into is using at least some percentage of the platform to good advantage and making us all look good. Uh, yeah, I don't I for, well, first, I'll say I think there's probably an 80 20 rule buried underneath all this, where if we really look at what m the most people who have questions are asking, they probably all fall into the bread and butter category, it, it, I would guess, in an 80 percent rate. Yep. The goal would be to try to achieve 20 where we could all find it useful and where it could actually do a lot more of this synthesis, where it could say, you know, strategically, how might the script work? And what if I had to do this and take all those things into consideration? I think that this work needs to happen now to 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 hit the bread and butter ones so that the road will rise to when the when the models are a lot more sophisticated as well, too. So, um, yeah, and, yeah and, and, and updated as the platform changes, too. I think that's really important, Eric. OK, uh, final 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 yeah, comment, then I'm done. It's a. Uh... Head First, a series of books by O'Reilly, a very interesting um, approach to education, highly visual. They have, uh, and I read it for JavaScript and a few other things, you know, and they make stories with emotional impact. It's, uh, uh, anyway, it's worth a look. Uh, but uh, I'll close by saying that this looks terrific. Uh, it's very exciting. Oh, cool. And I'll join the Discord. 
Baby Thank steps. You. Baby steps. Thank you very much, Tony. Insightful feedback today. I really appreciate it. Uh, Beverly. Oh, wait. I know you're saying something smart, but you're muted. The, the human interaction on community is a big plus for a lot of people. And, and some people need to know that a human is communicating, but then maybe point them to, okay, look at this. You know, yeah. go make your prompt here and and see what you get. But I, you know, hello, I, welcome to the community. It's really a big plus. And then on the expert uh, reinforcement, a couple examples that I think about a lot is like the PHP.net has all of their functions, and then at the bottom it has people contributing. Well, here's how I used it, or don't do this, do that kind of thing, which. Yep. always helped me when I was learning that. And then same thing, Wikipedia has contributions that kind of enhance with there. But, you know, like both of those actually can have bad information. You oh, sure. It's just, but that's kind of the concept is that we are, we're taking, you know, here's the answer, but now here's more things to kind of enhance that answer. And so. Absolutely. Well, it, absolutely. And, and keep in mind that there'll be more truth coming from other sources that might counter yeah. the wrongness of that. It's just really fascinating how this all works when it all, you know, gets together and starts to learn from itself. So, um, and by the way, the, you know, you mentioned like the humans, whatever, as a trainer, one of my philosophies that I feel is really important is I feel that multidisciplinary learning is critically important for a successful journey. So even though I was, uh, you know, you know, kind of cut my teeth online as a trainer, I still conduct live training classes all the time. I, I don't think it's an either or. I think they're a one, two, yeah. punch. and then yeah. having ad additional assistance or additional, you know, resources available to you, like community is just part of that story. This would be another thing that learners can have um, to be able to help them on their journey. I, I don't think it would ever replace anything. I just think it would be a really fascinating complement to some of the other things that they already have available. And plus just at scale, it's the same concept of the guide on the side. Every single learner could have their own guide on the side, which is just something that's not even possible right now. All right. Thanks. Well, this is fun. Nice to see uh, friendly faces, hear friendly voices. Thank you all for giving me a chance to sit and talk about stuff for a while. And um um, I look forward to hearing from you guys. Please join the Discord so we can continue this conversation. And um, you know, if anybody has any other questions, I'm happy to chat with you. But I'm, I, can't, I mean, if you're anything like my wife, you're tired of hearing to me talk at this point. I mean that in a loving manner. I was expecting a laugh from that, but everybody's muted, so um. <laughs> we did laugh. Like, we did okay, laugh. Thank you, <laughs> Lexi. You know, you met my wife. You know, she would laugh at that. So. <laughs> Well, we haven't had you on Dig FM yet. That I at least as long as I no, this is my here, first. But, yeah, this yeah. is my first on Dig FM. I'm so honored. Well, you know, uh, it, it was it was something I've always wanted. I've, I I used to attend some like in per in person, right? Uh, like over the years, I snuck into the back of the room on a couple. But you know, now that it's on Zoom, I like to do as many of these as I can. I committed myself in 2024 to doing as much of these one to many as I possibly could on the topic of AI. And I've, I've done quite a bit. So anybody ask me and I say, yes, I, I don't even think twice about it. And I was really okay. delighted. Uh, actually it was Vince uh, that, that suggested this. So I was yeah, really he's not even here. Yeah. What's up Vince. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, but thanks Vince. If you made it this far in the recording, I appreciate the invite. By the way, Chris, I have to give you just a little anecdote. I, um, I, we randomly settled on listening to a podcast that you did with the two mats. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Early on. Oh, yeah, and, a while ago, yeah. Yeah, and I was driving back to San Francisco from east of Sacramento. And like you guys kept saying, no one's listening to us anymore. This is going on forever. And I'm like, like this is the hours. best podcast ever. It's going to get me all the way home. You're like, perfect. Sacramento. Yeah. We were literally like, yeah, no one's even listening You're to like, us. No and we're like, no. no one's listening. And I'm like, I'm still listening. So I listened to the whole thing. It was awesome. It was so funny because I was listening to the Matt and Matt podcast and Petrowski was on and he was talking about some thing that we had done together. And I was like, I texted him. Like I was listening to the radio or something. I was literally like, dude, that, oh, never mind. That podcast you did like two weeks ago. I'm, I'm talking to you like you're recording it right now. So I similar oh. anecdote of that, but um, I love the long form podcast for those drives, especially so. 
Anyway, it was awesome. Thanks, Alexi. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, by the way, um, I'm pretty proud of some of those old school ones. Like uh, I did a couple with uh, Todd and Jeremy like way back in the day and and speculated on this thing called GPT-3 coming out. And so I'm really proud of listening to those things. Um, those really turned out well. So um, I keep those bookmarked just in case I, you know, need a little inspiration. I'll go listen back to those myself too. If it's a guilty pleasure. Awesome. But thanks for listening. Well, all right, I <clears throat> we did it. Um, happy to come back anytime. Uh, if there's anything along these lines you guys are curious about, uh, love to chat. Eric, I will not set foot on campus again for a training without letting you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, thanks so much for letting me be part of this. And um, I'll make sure to share the uh, link whenever you post it. Just drop me an email and I'll, I'll put it out on LinkedIn and Twitter and stuff like that. So um, appreciate you guys hanging in there. Thanks for the show. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. I see y'all. Bye-bye. Cheers.